My friends Jessica and James have been together for roughly six years, and they've lived in their house for over a year now. I'm over quite often as well. I've been friends and co-workers with Jessica for four years. They're both wonderful people, and they've kind of adopted me into their family. They keep me alive by feeding me a few times a week, so I'm very grateful to them. I was over for dinner after work a few weeks ago. We all arrived at their place within minutes of each other. We all drank and caught up, and after a little while, James went outside to grill up some steaks. He came inside, though, and asked why I'd kissed the door. I was pretty confused, of course. I went over to the sliding glass door where he was. Sure as the world is round, there was a kiss print on the outside of the door, lipstick and everything. Few things first. James and Jessica are both shorter than I am. He's about 5 foot 8 and she's 5 foot 2. I'm 5 foot 11. The kiss print was at a height that if I popped up my balls on my feet, I could just barely reach that spot with my lips, far above where either of them could reach. I hadn't worn any of that sort of stuff in many, many years. They both thought it was me playing a prank on them for some reason. Jessica on the lipstick. I guess they thought I could have just been trying to freak them out or something. Spoiler alert, it was not me. I happened to be a smoker, so I did frequent their back porch through that door. I guess that made it all the more suspicious. Their porch was pretty difficult to get to as well. We got three sides, right? Well, the right side is a 30-foot drop, the left side is a 10-foot drop with a spiked fence, and inside that fence is immediately James Grill and some workout equipment. It was a pretty narrow, not easily navigated space. In the front of the porch, I suppose, would be the easiest way to get in, but you'd have to be quite dedicated to climb all that way. They had real thick, tall hedges around the entire thing, too. You'd get pretty scraped up trying to do all this. At this point, I was thinking Jessica had just climbed up on a chair and was trying to prank me or something. James cleaned off the glass, and we quickly went on with our night. A few nights later, though, I'm back at their place. I was going outside for a smoke when I saw another kiss mark on the glass, in the same place as before. About a foot below that was a smudgy heart drawn in dirt crudely. I'm not sure if this person had really greasy hands or if they used spit or something, but that was extra creepy. I pointed this out to my friends, and again they thought it was me. James even insisted I clean it off. None of us were the type to prank exactly. I still felt the most logical explanation was Jessica was doing this for some reason. The next time it happened, a few days later, I hadn't been there for a while. Jessica called me up. She was a little bit accusatory and rattled, of course. I did have a key to their home. She asked me if I had used it to go inside and write something on the glass again, because when they'd woken up, they noticed some writing on the door. I told her it was not me. She let it go, but I could still tell she was kind of suspicious. At this point, I knew it wasn't her either. It could be, but she would have given up the ghost already. She seemed to be genuinely mad and scared of me. It didn't seem funny at all. It happened many more times as well. Once, even when I was over there. Then there was a break for about a week. Then it started up in earnest when I wasn't there for a while. I had to go to another state for work. While I was gone, Jessica video called me. She saw I was in my hotel room, not there, and just started freaking out. She said this whole time she'd really been holding out hope it was me. At least then, it wouldn't be terrifying. Alas, I was a thousand miles away. There was new writing on her back door, seemingly made that very same night, with a heart drawn underneath as well. She apologized to me for being so adamant it was me. She just hadn't wanted to be wrong. I told her it was okay, but also told her the person she should really be calling right now is the police. She did call them. They came several hours later, looked around for five minutes, and pretty much just told her, Hey, that's weird. They told her she could take some pictures and submit them online. Wow, thanks guys, what a big help. We were all completely freaked out. We don't really know what's going on. They ordered a camera and it came a couple of days ago. They put it on the porch, but so far, nothing. I'll let you know if anything further happens.
About 10 years ago, after graduating from high school, me and five of my friends, all girls by the way, decided we were going to rent out a house together right by campus. We were all fairly young, 17 to 19 years old, and very broke as well. The house wasn't exactly in the best neighborhood. One night, we had some people over. Nothing crazy, just a few of our friends. We were all hanging out on our front porch and having a few beers together. We called it a night around 1 or 2 a.m. All of our friends went home and we all went to bed. The next morning, we were woken very startlingly to a knock from the police. One of the girls let us know the cops were at our door, so we all came downstairs in a panic. Naturally, we thought we were in some sort of trouble. The officer informed us there had been some sketchy activity on our front porch last night. At first, we thought he was talking about us having a party with people over, but no. Apparently, sometime after we'd gone to bed, there was a man in his late 40s or early 50s, looking through all our windows. The officer had just happened to be driving by and saw the man peering in. When the man saw the officer, he frantically grabbed an empty beer can off our front porch and sat down on one of our chairs. He pretended to be drinking. The officer obviously thought this was even stranger, so he stopped to see what was going on here. He asked the man if he lived in the house. The man had told him he was a close friend of ours and that all of us had just turned in for the night. He decided to finish his beer before he took off. He started describing things about us in a horrifying amount of detail, even some things he shouldn't have known. It seemed he'd been watching us for some time. I'm sure the officer could tell some sketchy shit was going on here, as he offered to give the man a ride to wherever he lived. The man hesitated for a moment, and insisted he simply wanted to finish his beer. The cop just told him to come with him. When he did a search of the man's name, tons of charges came up. The scariest part was all the charges of pedophilia he had, quite a lot of them. Thank God for that officer driving by. We checked our windows the next day, only to find they'd been unlocked, and some of them had been tampered with. This guy would have had no trouble at all climbing through one of those windows while we were asleep. Needless to say, we made sure every window was secure in that house, and we were a lot more cautious of our surroundings from then on. The cop actually gave us the name of the man, so we could look him up along with all of his pages of charges. This guy was terrifying. One of those people where you can just tell from a look in their eyes that they're not someone you want to associate with. Still gives me the chills to think about. Warning. This story has some graphic details, so I'm just going to get it out there because it's been heavy on my shoulders for about a month now. The night of National Day here in my country, after having a nice meal with some of my friends, my boyfriend asked me to go check on one of his friends. They had a father-son kind of relationship, and his friend was not feeling very well. He had some heart-related conditions, and my boyfriend was quite worried. On our way home, we decided to stop by his place real quick, around 10 at night. We got there, drank a beer, had a friendly chat with him, his wife, and his stepson for a moment. After about 45 minutes, we were just about to leave when we heard a crazed howling coming from outside in front of the house. In retrospect, it almost sounded like a zombie's growling. His stepson cautiously opened the door and asked what was going on. He didn't even have time to finish his sentence before a man erupted at the door. He was covered in blood. I mean dark black dried blood. So much of it I almost thought he was a different ethnicity because his skin had such a dark tone from all that blood. It took me about 30 seconds to realize that all that blood was coming from two gigantic gaping wounds in the side of his head. I must say... He looked and sounded like a living corpse. There were three gashes. The biggest was on the middle from his forehead all the way down to the back of his head, two inches wide at the largest. The guy began to scream and yell and thrash around before falling to the ground and freezing just like in the movies. We jumped into action. This guy was clearly not in good shape. 
We brought him out without looking back. I can't really explain what went through my mind in that moment, but I knew that if we were not on our way to the hospital right now, this man would not survive. I sat him down on the front passenger seat and did my best to keep him awake while my boyfriend drove. We called 911 the minute we got onto the road so they could send an ambulance to meet us on the way there. The agent on the phone started asking me to pull the car onto the side of the highway and wait for the ambulance to get there, but we couldn't do that. The man was clearly going to die very soon. We kept on going as fast as possible. We arrived at the hospital before the ambulance and the police. As soon as we got there, medics rushed outside and came to help him right away. The police then arrived too, and took our disposition. Guess what happened next though? The man had been so badly hurt that he fell into a coma only 30 minutes after arriving, before the police could interrogate him as to what happened. From that moment on, police started procedures for a homicide investigation, and we were considered the prime suspects. They finally let us go home at 4 a.m. They came back the next day asking further questions and letting us know that now they knew we were not related to this crime. They informed us the man had also escaped the hospital the next morning. The attack was probably gang-related, and those gashes had been done by a machete. He'd managed to survive the attack because he was completely strung out on heroin. I'll never forget that night and that man's horrifying screams. At least I can hold on to the fact that I helped to save a life. I've been wanting to share this for a while, so here goes. In 2007, when I was 12 years old, my family and I took a trip to Key Biscayne, Florida, with some of my cousins and family friends. Naturally, while at the resort, my cousins and I would all hang out at the kids' club. Well, there were always a bunch of kids to hang out with, epic chicken fingers with ranch dressing, and tons of fun games for us all to play. There was a director of the kids' club who watched us and facilitated all of the activities. His name was Dan. In retrospect, I'm sure you can imagine Dan was a major fucking creep. He was around 40 years old, super tall, skinny, and was balding quite badly. The worst part is that he always made us call him Dan Dan the Animal Man. Side note, these sorts of memories leave me in awe of how naive and blinded to danger I was. I'm sure most of us were as a kid, really. If I ever met this guy now, I wouldn't want to get within a five-foot radius of him. At 12 years old, though, I was thinking he was awesome. Time is a wonderful thing, I suppose. Anyway, I digress. It was made clear to all of us suddenly that Dan, for unknown reasons, was leaving the hotel in a week. None of this fazed me, though. On our last day there, I just so happened to lose my cell phone. It was a bright blue chocolate cell phone, if anyone remembers those gems with the spinning wheel. I quickly told my parents I couldn't find it, considering this was already the second phone I'd lost that year. My mom yelled at me and told me if I didn't find it, I'd be grounded for a long time. I rushed around the entire hotel, looking everywhere for my phone. Along the way, I just so happened to go into the kids' club to see if anyone there had found it. The room that was typically bustling with kids and activity was now eerily quiet and empty. Dan was just sitting on a couch all by himself. Hey, Dan, did you by chance see my phone? I asked him. He responded right away. Oh, yeah. Actually, I found it and put it in the lost and found in the basement. Come with me, I'll show you. Thinking nothing of this, I mindlessly followed behind Dan as he led me all the way to the back of the hotel. We had walked for around three minutes before we arrived at the foot of an abandoned stairwell leading into a dark basement. We were now at the very back of the hotel in a strange area I'd never seen before, and no one else was in sight. Are you sure it's down here? I asked, very confused. I was staring down a long flight of stairs, leading into pitch black darkness. The walls were made of unpainted concrete. It didn't even look like it could be a storage area, let alone a basement with a lost and found. Dan nodded happily and held the door open for me, 
motioning for me to head down myself. Something in that moment suddenly woke up. I'm not sure if it was instinct, fear, or just luck, but I immediately knew I could not go down there. Before Dan could say or do anything, I blurted out, Never mind, I think I left it with my mom. I darted as fast as I could back to the hotel lobby. I was shaken up. Something about that situation was not right. I just knew he was going to hurt me. As a kid who wore rose-colored glasses and was overly trusting of others, that really shook me. I tried to compose myself and figured I'd investigate a bit more just to be sure. I walked up to the concierge of the hotel and asked them where the lost and found was because I'd lost my phone recently. The woman at the front desk was very nice and told me the lost and found was just right there, right next to her. She then asked me what kind of phone I'd lost. After I told her it was a blue chocolate flip phone, she smiled and pulled it right out of the box under her desk. Don't worry, someone turned it in here earlier, she said and handed me my phone with a big smile. Wait, so you're telling me the lost and found isn't in the basement? I stammered. No, sweetie, the hotel is still under construction. The basement is being rebuilt. There's not even any electricity down there or anything. That scared the absolute shit out of me. I couldn't shake the feeling that man was dangerous. At the time, I was sharing a hotel room with my cousin, and she was the only person I told. Considering she was only eight at the time, I think all I did was really freak her out. Now I'm 26, though, and I think back on that moment a lot. I wonder, what if? What would have happened to me if I'd gone down to the basement with Dan Dan the Animal Man? It truly feels like one of the most critical junctures of my entire life. I'm happy I knew to get the hell out of there before it was too late. I recently contacted that hotel to inquire about past Kid Club employees named Dan from 2007, just to see if he's still around somewhere, or on a sex offenders list, maybe even in jail. I told them this whole story, but they refused to give me any information about him and sounded pretty sketchy about it, honestly. I'll continue to do some research, and if I ever find more information, I suppose I'll tell you guys as well. My name is Leia. I live in the north of France in one of the houses in a family neighborhood. I was 15 years old when this story happened. My parents were separating. My mother was a nurse, so I was often left at home alone. It was November of 2021, I believe. It would get much darker much earlier around that time. So that meant I was home alone in absolute darkness. Around 7 p.m., I heard some knocking at my door. I wasn't expecting anyone to come by, though. I was paralyzed in surprise. A few minutes later, the knocking repeated. I looked in the peephole of my door, but I couldn't see anyone there. I thought it must be a prank by children in my neighborhood or something. The knocking stopped just a few moments later, and nothing else happened for four more days. It was a Saturday this time. I had invited two of my girlfriends to my house, Luis and Satine. That day, my mother was at work. We were watching a movie in my living room when I went to pick up my charger in my room. My two friends were alone downstairs when they heard those same knocks as the night before. Their first thought was that my mother was coming home early. They didn't know about that previous incident. They opened the door, only to see no one was there once more. The three of us were confused. We didn't know what was going on. Luis reassured us, though, telling us surely we were creating this stress in our heads. Maybe it was just a coincidence with that knocking from last night. The rest of the evening went over quite well, and nobody knocked for the rest of that night. That's what I told myself, at least, until next Wednesday night. I'd just come back home from the grocery store after buying some pasta, after eating, I went back to my room to finish my homework with my headphones in. I was listening to some music. Suddenly, I began to hear banging against the walls. Naturally, at first, I thought this was my rabbit, getting angry and thumping because he was hungry. After a few blows, though, 
I could hear things moving around on their own. I took courage with both hands and decided to bravely go down to the living room. In the reflection of the mirror in the hallway, I saw the silhouette of a man tapping on my window with a crowbar. I was petrified. The man still hadn't seen me. He then came to knock on the door, the exact same patterns as the other two times with his crowbar. Still grasping all my courage best I could, I grabbed a knife. I quietly walked over to the front door. The man was tapping with his crowbar louder and louder. I shouted through the door, telling him to get fucked, and that I was already on the phone with the police. As soon as he heard that, he ran away, and he didn't come back after. As soon as he left, I really did call the police. I was bluffing when he ran away. After hanging up, I cried. I thought that would have been the last moments of my life. He looked like he was about to try and break the window in. Ten minutes later, a patrol arrived, but they couldn't do anything except patrol regularly around my home. The man was never caught or arrested. I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't heard the noises that day. This was the moment when I was most scared in my entire life, and it changed everything for me. Let me start by saying this is something I've had to go through, and there are still some things about it I don't really understand. I don't talk about this to anyone in my personal life, really. Not because of how painful it is, mind you, but I just don't like people's reactions to it. No matter how well-intentioned the other person is, it tends to alter relationships permanently. And though, over the past 21 years, I've learned to talk about what really happened. I'll tell it from my perspective from back then, the way I remember it. I lived with my mom at the time. My parents had been divorced for three years, which, for a seven-year-old, is pretty much your entire life. My mom back then was someone who took extra care with me. She didn't like it when I played in the yard. She didn't like it when I spent a lot of time at our neighbor's house always personally dropped me off at school and was waiting for me at the end of the day to take me home. She taught me to lock all three locks on our door and how to see what different cars were parked outside and which ones were familiar. Of course, stranger danger. She was, I now understand, paranoid. There's lots more things, but I'll just skip all that. One night, we were sitting on the couch watching TV when a small pickup truck pulled into our driveway. This was really strange. We weren't expecting anyone. Even worse, though, was my mom's reaction. I'd never seen her move so fast. She leapt up from the couch to make sure the door was locked. Then she ran to me, picked me up hard, and carried me to her bedroom and back. She told me to hide underneath the bed. She ran out of the room and closed the door behind her. I heard a man pounding on the front door. Then she started yelling and screaming at him. All of a sudden there was a giant crash. Moments later, the bedroom door flew open and my mom ran inside. There was a big man behind her. I could see the cuffs of his jeans and the toes of his black and brown shoes. My mom was screaming. She tried to turn around and slam the bedroom door shut, but suddenly it pushed open and she was thrown onto the bed right above me. The heels of her bare feet were by my head hovering just a few inches off the floor, and the man's shoes were in the doorway. There was complete silence for a moment, before my mom started to quaver audibly. I heard two really loud pops, and nothing moved. The man's feet ran away. I heard his truck start and pull out of the driveway. I waited for my mom to come and get me. Her feet slid down to touch the floor, and the rest of her did too. Her hair was all messy and frizzy, she had her back turned to me, curled with her knees against her chest, and her nightshirt was up in her armpits. I put my hand on her back and was about to ask her if she was okay, when I saw a pool of liquid coming toward me from under her body. I flew away from her, out from under the bed and onto the other side of the room. I was probably screaming at her or something. It seemed like just a few seconds had passed, pressed hard against the wall as I could with my face buried against the baseboard before I began to hear sirens. It was a big city, so I was used to that noise, but it got louder and louder. 
Now more feet ran through the front door and into my house. I thought the man had come back. I heard people yelling police and thought that's what I needed. I needed the police right now. The rest of the night, feet stomping, blankets wrapped around me. I was whisked past my mom so I couldn't see her. I remember really wanting to tell them to help her, but I couldn't find a way to get the words out. It took a long time for me to forgive myself for that. Of course, they were going to help her. And they put her into an ambulance while I stood on the front lawn and watched. I followed in a police car behind. Never really got the chance to see her again. And they said she died in the ambulance. I saw her at the funeral, of course, but that wasn't really her. And the questions answered later don't really help that much, but here they are. My dad had cheated on my mom, and my mom cheated on my dad in revenge. The guy she was with decided to leave his own wife for my mom. My dad left because everything was so messed up. My mom felt really guilty and broke it off with the guy. He was very upset with how she'd ruined his life. She had been worried about him for years after. He found her through a mutual friend, and that was that. The man went back to his apartment after and killed himself, too. There was a lot of time with the police. I talked to a lady in a room in front of a camera. My dad came and took me to his house to live with him. It was an extremely confusing time. I realized in that moment there are two English languages. One that kids speak, and one that adults speak and only adults are fluent in both. They would have conversations with me in that foreign tongue, going above my head, then switch to child language and say, Now tell us what you saw. You're going to live with me now, and stuff like that. That's my scary story. My dad really wasn't all that into kids. I just kind of pulled inside myself and worked on school. I went to college, have a good job, have good friends, all of that but I've learned not to speak about this. The internet is great for anonymously talking about things, but I'm not sure if this really helps anyone. It's just a sad and scary story. I've spent most of my life only talking about this to therapists, and despite what you might think of seeing it on TV, it's actually really helpful. I remember every moment of that night, every breath, every footstep, every loud noise and whimper. And I always will. This story is a different kind of scary, but it is still pretty spooky. This happened back when I was in college, when on a complete whim I hopped on the bus and went down to Daytona Beach for spring break. Well, it wasn't a complete whim, I guess. My friend Joey already happened to be down there, and he'd really been bugging me to come down and join him. Joey really didn't work or go to school, but his parents did have a lot of money. Rather than going down to Daytona for spring break for a week, he was there throughout the entire season. He eventually did convince me to come down, when he promised he would bring me back after the week was over. I only had enough money to make the trip one way if I was going to spend any money there at all. One thing that Joey had left out about our spring break trip is that he had driven his father's motorcycle to get down there. If I wanted to ride back home, it would have to be on the back of his bike. I was not completely comfortable with that arrangement. I did eventually accept it though, because if I spent the rest of my money for a ticket home, I wouldn't be able to have any money for spring break itself. I had a good five days or so down there. Then, in order to get back to school on time, Joey would have to take me back home. It would be a two-day drive, and we would have to get a hotel after the first night. Thankfully, he had his parents' magic credit card and would be paying for everything. We got started relatively early in the day. We went up through Florida and eventually made it into Georgia at around 1 p.m. This is when things started to get a bit ominous. It began to get dark very fast as the most foreboding storm clouds I had ever seen in my life began to roll in. These weren't just black clouds. These were green clouds, which blocked out the entire sky. It was springtime in Georgia, and by 4 p.m., it was pitch black outside. 
The only positive was that it hadn't started pouring yet. We wanted to try and make it as far as we could before having to get the hotel room. I had never seen such a sight in my entire life. I really don't think I can do it justice just by describing it. The clouds looked like they were being driven with purpose down on us. I got truly afraid when they started spinning around like funnels right above our heads. I didn't really know if this was indicative of a tornado forming or what, but I could imagine it wasn't a positive thing regardless. Eventually, it began to storm and rain hard. If you've never ridden a motorcycle through a thunderstorm, I can't begin to tell you how scary that is. Each drop of rain slapped us on our faces. My body felt like needles was stabbing into my skin. It hurt real bad. I was worried that the force of the wind and rain would blow our motorcycle off the damn road, but Joey didn't appear to be ready to stop anytime soon. I didn't want to appear like a wuss either, but trust me, I was really scared. We saw a sign for a Holiday Inn at the next exit. It was then that Joey yelled back and asked me if I wanted to take that exit and stop there. I was in severe pain from the storm, and I was cold as well. I was frightened, but I thought about the kind of person Joey was. He was very adventurous, as if you hadn't already figured that out, and for some odd reason, I thought he would have more respect for me if I told him to hold out a bit longer. I yelled back to him, No, let's see how far we can go before we have to stop. Joey laughed and we continued on. I think we went for another hour or so before Joey decided we were going to have to stop right now. It was just too fierce out there. We found an exit with what I believe was a hotel called Quality Inn or something. We checked in and I decided I needed to take a shower first. Joey was fine with that because he wanted to watch the weather anyways. Joey flipped on the television and of course there was a weather report on right away. I'll never forget in my entire life what it said. The town just off the exit that Joey had asked me if we wanted to stop at was hit just a half hour earlier by that tornado. One of the buildings shown on the news as being completely destroyed? The Holiday Inn we were both going to stay at. We were shocked. If we had taken that exit just an hour ago and checked into that hotel, we would not be here right now. We would have been there right when that tornado destroyed it. It was really weird, because I wanted so badly to get out of that storm, but for whatever reason, something told me it was not right to exit at that moment. I live in a small town with my family. I was 19 when this happened. My brother was 13 years old. This happened when he was on spring break from school. My parents had already gone to work, and I had a job too, but I didn't have to go in until later in the day. There was going to be a period of about four hours or so after I went to work that my brother would be home alone in the house. That wasn't too big a deal to us, though. He was already 13 years old. On this day, I had about an hour before it was time for me to leave for work. It was around 11 a.m., I believe. When I woke up, it was raining and storming very hard. It was pretty fierce out there. The wind was strong and blowing the trees back and forth. The sky was completely black with clouds. It looked more like the sun had recently set rather than recently having risen. The rain was pounding our house, too. I was the type who didn't like to get up really long before going to work. I had to be there at 12.30. So I woke up at 11, made myself some coffee, and went into the living room to relax for a while. I was watching a bit of TV, and halfway watching the storm as well, when something outside caught my eye. I looked over, only to see a man out in the middle of the storm, walking down the street. He was tall and dressed in all black, but the weirdest thing was, he didn't seem to have an umbrella, or even a raincoat. It was quite strange. I figured maybe he had just been out and about and gotten caught in the storm, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry either. As he walked down the street, he watched our house with a strange look on his face. Then he turned the block. I got a feeling something was wrong here, but I tried not to let it bother me too much. 
As I was watching the television more, about ten minutes later, it caught my eye once again. I looked out the window and was quite surprised to see the man wandering around the block once more. Just like the last time, he kept glancing at our house, pivoting his head as he walked along. This time, I was much more concerned than I had been before. Before, the man was just a strange weirdo walking around in the rain. Now, he was a strange weirdo walking around in the rain who seemed to have something on his mind, and it seemed to have something to do with my home. At first, I could have dismissed this all as him just having been caught out in the storm, but walking around the block multiple times indicated he was in no hurry to get anywhere. Just a strange man walking in the rain. I had finished my coffee and I had to get to work soon, but I decided I needed to wait and see if the man would circle our house yet again. I was really hoping it wasn't something other than just a weirdo who liked the rain. Maybe he really wasn't singling out our home. Perhaps he was casing every house on the block for an empty one. This was the third time he walked around, once again looking at our home specifically. I got really concerned now. It was exactly like before, too. I really wasn't sure what to do in this instance. I didn't think the guy had done anything wrong or illegal, so I couldn't call the police on him, but I didn't feel safe leaving my 13-year-old brother home alone. It was a slim chance, but there was a chance this man was going to try to break in when I left or something. I couldn't take my brother to work with me, so I had to find some other way. When I left, all the cars would be gone from the driveway. That may be exactly what this guy was looking for. After going over it in my head again and again, I decided I was being paranoid enough that I should see if I could drop my brother off at a friend's house. I explained to him that I was worried because something weird was going on here. I asked him if he had anybody who would let him stay until my parents got off work. Thankfully, he did. He called up his friend Dylan, and I dropped him off over there and headed to work myself. I double-checked and made sure everything was locked up tight before I left, too. I was working, and the rain was still coming down violently for hours. We were not very busy because of it. Around 6 p.m., though, I got a call from my mother. Someone truly had broken into our house. I wasn't really surprised, although I did feel like an idiot for not having called the police before. What bothered me the most, though, was not that the house had indeed been broken into. What bothered me is that they didn't steal a single thing, or even touch anything. That told me that the man who broke in wasn't trying to steal our things. When I explained what happened to my parents... They were very happy I hadn't left my little brother in the house alone, because who knows what would have happened to him. This was a story I grew up hearing my mom telling me. I was really young when this happened, and I know for a fact it must have been before I was five years old. I have some foggy memories of something happening especially because my mom at the time didn't want me to freak out. Some context. First, we have a family all over the country. I remember spending so much of my childhood just on road trips from state to state to visit different family members. We knew our ins and outs on traveling. Two, when I was a child, I would randomly hug strangers a lot and tell them I loved them. I was so filled with joy and love, it just spilled over onto other people. There was basically only one stranger I never immediately latched onto the second I saw them, and this is that story. My mom was taking me to visit some relatives, while my dad was staying at home to watch my brothers. She had to go house sit, and in general, was a better caretaker of me than my father was. It only made sense that I go with her. We were driving for hours until we finally hit a rest stop and got out to use the restroom. As we did so, we noticed immediately this guy meandering around the parking lot. According to my mom, it looked like he was closely watching everyone who was entering and leaving. The second we got out of the car, he began to observe us too. My mom held my hand tight as we headed to the restroom, but immediately picked up on the fact that I let go of her hand to hold on to her other hand the sight of her away from the man. 
Looking back, she told me it was clear somewhere in my tiny child brain. I must have picked up on some sign of danger or something. I seemed to be avoiding the man as much as I could, and would quicken my pace to the restroom and car as well. I never did that with any other stranger. I never blatantly avoided another adult like that. Anyway, we do our business and head back to the car. The man had gotten back to his car as well, and was now watching us get ready to leave. Only, as we did so, he began to follow us in his own car. My mom immediately realized what was going on and tried to shake him off on the highway. He just wouldn't budge though and tried to get as close to our car as he could. Apparently, while doing this, a semi-truck driver also on the road noticed how frantic and off she was driving and could see her looking back at his car. He realized what was going on and drove up to her side, kinda made eye contact with her. They were on the same page from then on. Turns out the driver had called up on his radio to other truckers in the area and told them what was going on. A bunch of drivers from different routes came onto the same highway we were traveling on. A few minutes later, they began to block the man's car off, essentially completely trapping him away from my mother and I. She turned onto an exit to get off the highway to another rest stop as the original truck driver followed us. The man still boxed in by the other trucks. He got out and talked to my mom and told her he'd picked up on what was happening. He asked us if we were okay and drove with us to a Burger King. He even got us something to eat. We talked quite a lot and he followed us back onto the road until eventually we went our separate routes. My friends and I enjoy hiking mountain bike trails in the woods, on a mountain nearby our houses. One day they couldn't go outside though, so I brought my younger sister with me instead. I was also going to bring my little brother, but he was going to be a little bit late, since today he was staying at a friend's house. This day was a little bit rainy, and was also quite cold. Nobody would be out hiking the trails today. They had never seen what my friends and I had been working on the past couple of months either, so that was the day to show them. Basically, you walk straight down a trail. When it turns 90 degrees, you go to the right just off it, then around a bend. There's an overgrown, abandoned forest road at this area. At the end of this forest road, we had made a small trail that led to the bottom of our MTB trail. My sister and I waited for my little brother to arrive. But then my mom called me, telling me my brother didn't know where to go. I told my sister to go all the way back to wait for him outside the trail in our neighborhood. She never saw him though. He decided since he didn't know where to go despite the clear instructions that he was just going to go back home, which my mom called to inform me. I called my sister to tell her to come back up the trail to meet up with me, telling her very clearly to make sure nobody was following her. This wasn't for our safety, but so nobody would discover these trails me and my friends were building. We wanted it to stay a secret. Something about this time was a bit different though. As my sister began to walk back down the trail, I could see through the forest all the way across the road to where she was on her way up. Then I thought to myself, wait, was she wearing a white jacket before? I realized as this figure got more towards the clearing, that this was not my little sister. This was a fully grown man. Nobody should have known about this trail, and even if they did, they would have no reason to come up here. Plus, the rain the past couple of days had made most of the trail muddy, extremely muddy. I started running down the trail, then hid behind a tree so I could call my sister and tell her not to come back. All of a sudden, I heard someone call out to me. What are you doing? It was my little sister. She had already made it all the way back up to where I was. I knew what was happening now. This man was following my sister specifically. I was terrified. I could tell my sister was starting to pick up something serious was going on as well. I grabbed her and hid her behind a tree with me. We waited for around 10 minutes, but I didn't see the person anywhere. There was no way to go but up the trail towards us, so unless this person was hiding in the trees off the forest road, they must have turned back. We started to make our way back, as quickly and quietly as possible. I started to get the sense though that I was being watched. We made it to our bikes, which were thankfully still there. It seemed the man hadn't tried to steal them. 
I told my sister to grab her bike so we could walk through the rest of the trail without the noise of our hub clicking. This way, we could hear everything going on around us. As we got towards the entrance of where the forest was, it was much easier to see the footprints. There was one set of large boot prints deep on top of my sister's smaller footprints, meaning they were more recent. I confirmed I was 100% not going insane. Once we got out of the forest, we started riding our bikes to the neighborhood, and I made sure to stay back to see we weren't being followed. We made it back home just fine in the end. We told our parents, who were just glad I was out there as well. All I could think about was what if my sister had been alone, or if the man had caught her while he was following her on the trail. What would have happened to her in the end? I don't like to think about it. My name is Leia. I live in the north of France in one of the houses in a family neighborhood. I was 15 years old when this story happened. My parents were separating. My mother was a nurse, so I was often left at home alone. It was November of 2021, I believe. It would get much darker much earlier around that time. So that meant I was home alone in absolute darkness. Around 7 p.m., I heard some knocking at my door. I wasn't expecting anyone to come by, though. I was paralyzed in surprise. A few minutes later, the knocking repeated. I looked in the peephole of my door, but I couldn't see anyone there. I thought it must be a prank by children in my neighborhood or something. The knocking stopped just a few moments later, and nothing else happened for four more days. It was a Saturday this time. I had invited two of my girlfriends to my house, Luis and Satine. That day, my mother was at work. We were watching a movie in my living room when I went to pick up my charger in my room. My two friends were alone downstairs when they heard those same knocks as the night before. Their first thought was that my mother was coming home early. They didn't know about that previous incident. They opened the door, only to see no one was there once more. The three of us were confused. We didn't know what was going on. Luis reassured us, though, telling us surely we were creating this stress in our heads. Maybe it was just a coincidence with that knocking from last night. The rest of the evening went over quite well, and nobody knocked for the rest of that night. That's what I told myself, at least, until next Wednesday night. I'd just come back home from the grocery store after buying some pasta, after eating, I went back to my room to finish my homework with my headphones in. I was listening to some music. Suddenly, I began to hear banging against the walls. Naturally, at first, I thought this was my rabbit, getting angry and thumping because he was hungry. After a few blows, though, I could hear things moving around on their own. I took courage with both hands and decided to bravely go down to the living room and the reflection of the mirror in the hallway, I saw the silhouette of a man tapping on my window with a crowbar. I was petrified. The man still hadn't seen me. He then came to knock on the door, the exact same patterns as the other two times with his crowbar. Still grasping all my courage best I could, I grabbed a knife. I quietly walked over to the front door. The man was tapping with his crowbar louder and louder, I shouted through the door, telling him to get fucked, and that I was already on the phone with the police. As soon as he heard that, he ran away, and he didn't come back after. As soon as he left, I really did call the police. I was bluffing when he ran away. After hanging up, I cried. I thought that would have been the last moments of my life. He looked like he was about to try and break the window in. Ten minutes later, a patrol arrived but they couldn't do anything except patrol regularly around my home. The man was never caught or arrested. I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't heard the noises that day. This was the moment when I was most scared in my entire life, and it changed everything for me. Let me start by saying this is something I've had to go through, and there are still some things about it I don't really understand. 
I don't talk about this to anyone in my personal life, really. Not because of how painful it is, mind you, but I just don't like people's reactions to it. No matter how well-intentioned the other person is, it tends to alter relationships permanently. And though, over the past 21 years, I've learned to talk about what really happened, I'll tell it from my perspective from back then, the way I remember it. I lived with my mom at the time. My parents had been divorced for three years, which for a seven-year-old is pretty much your entire life. My mom back then was someone who took extra care with me. She didn't like it when I played in the yard. She didn't like it when I spent a lot of time at our neighbor's house, always personally dropped me off at school, and was waiting for me at the end of the day to take me home. She taught me to lock all three locks on our door, and how to see what different cars were parked outside, and which ones were familiar. Of course, stranger danger. She was, I now understand, paranoid. There's lots more things, but I'll just skip all that. One night, we were sitting on the couch watching TV, when a small pickup truck pulled into our driveway. This was really strange. We weren't expecting anyone. Even worse, though, was my mom's reaction. I'd never seen her move so fast. She leapt up from the couch to make sure the door was locked. Then she ran to me, picked me up hard, and carried me to her bedroom and back. She told me to hide underneath the bed. She ran out of the room and closed the door behind her. I heard a man pounding on the front door. Then she started yelling and screaming at him. All of a sudden there was a giant crash. Moments later, the bedroom door flew open and my mom ran inside. There was a big man behind her. I could see the cuffs of his jeans and the toes of his black and brown shoes. My mom was screaming. She tried to turn around and slam the bedroom door shut, but suddenly it pushed open and she was thrown onto the bed right above me. The heels of her bare feet were by my head, hovering just a few inches off the floor, and the man's shoes were in the doorway. There was complete silence for a moment, before my mom started to quaver audibly. I heard two really loud pops, and nothing moved. The man's feet ran away. I heard his truck start and pull out of the driveway. I waited for my mom to come and get me. Her feet slid down to touch the floor, and the rest of her did too. Her hair was all messy and frizzy. She had her back turned to me, curled with her knees against her chest, and her nightshirt was up in her armpits. I put my hand on her back and was about to ask her if she was okay, when I saw a pool of liquid coming toward me from under her body. I flew away from her, out from under the bed and onto the other side of the room. I was probably screaming at her or something. It seemed like just a few seconds had passed. Pressed hard against the wall as I could with my face buried against the baseboard before I began to hear sirens. It was a big city, so I was used to that noise, but it got louder and louder. Now more feet ran through the front door and into my house. I thought the man had come back. I heard people yelling police and thought that's what I needed. I needed the police right now. The rest of the night, feet stomping, blankets wrapped around me, I was whisked past my mom so I couldn't see her. I remember really wanting to tell them to help her, but I couldn't find a way to get the words out. It took a long time for me to forgive myself for that. Of course, they were going to help her. And they put her into an ambulance while I stood on the front lawn and watched. I followed in a police car behind. Never really got the chance to see her again. And they said she died in the ambulance. I saw her at the funeral, of course. That wasn't really her. The questions answered later don't really help that much, but here they are. My dad had cheated on my mom, and my mom cheated on my dad in revenge. The guy she was with decided to leave his own wife for my mom. My dad left because everything was so messed up. My mom felt really guilty and broke it off with the guy. He was very upset with how she'd ruined his life. She had been worried about him for years after. He found her through a mutual friend, and that was that. The man went back to his apartment after and killed himself, too. There was a lot of time with the police. I talked to a lady in a room in front of a camera. My dad came and took me to his house to live with him. It was an extremely confusing time. I realized in that moment there are two English languages, one that kids speak and one that adults speak, and only adults are fluent in both. 
they would have conversations with me in that foreign tongue, going above my head, then switch to child language and say, Now, tell us what you saw. You're going to live with me now, and stuff like that. That's my scary story. My dad really wasn't all that into kids. I just kind of pulled inside myself and worked on school. I went to college, have a good job, have good friends, all of that. But I've learned not to speak about this. The internet is great for anonymously talking about things. But I'm not sure if this really helps anyone. It's just a sad and scary story. I've spent most of my life only talking about this to therapists. And despite what you might think of seeing it on TV... It's actually really helpful. I remember every moment of that night. Every breath, every footstep, every loud noise and whimper. And I always will. I just remembered a fun encounter that might serve as a warning to those working late at night. I was 24 at the time this happened, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than the other nights, as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing at around 12am instead of keeping customers until 2.30. Usually I'd be the only one left, as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on. Since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on either. About two months in of regularly closing at 12 a.m., I was walking home. I used to bring some bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone, as I'd been followed and chased home many times before. In fact, we'd often get men waiting after hours just for the girls to come out, knowing we'd eventually have to after closing. I didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home, as I didn't have a car at that time. I'd had a few weird experiences with Uber drivers not actually taking me home. It's surprising how often fake cabs try to show up or the drivers just harass you until you pretend to show interest or give them some way of contacting you. Uber just gives you a $5 coupon for all the trouble. I guess that's a story for another time, though. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown as well. Often at this time, I'd see about a handful of people around. The streets were generally pretty empty though. I was walking along when I noticed a parked car about a block away. The driver turned and looked at me, then you turned around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he was catcalling me, trying to get me to come into his car. I didn't engage, of course, and simply kept on walking. We were maybe a block or two past the initial spot I'd seen him, and he was still slowly driving along the sidewalk. I would have crossed the street, but I didn't have to want to get anywhere near his car. He kept this up until about the halfway mark, when he took off in his car and I was relieved he was now gone. But of course, that wasn't it. Guess who comes blasting back down the road? He did. Now my walk turned into a jog which then turned into me full-on running. I was running behind closed bars and businesses, trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I lived. He followed me for so long that at one point I was even running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I would end up on, his car would always be waiting for me. Eventually, I happened to run right in front of his car while it was parked on the side street beside my place. I ran into my house to the back entrance, the back entrance was obscured by plenty of trees, cars, and the surrounding houses. There were multiple unit homes as well, so I was confident he hadn't seen what door I'd gone in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday, and I'm walking home once more. Guess whose car was parked exactly at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four weeks. Except, as time went on, he started parking closer on the street to the front of my house each time. I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance. I stayed with them when he tried to follow me, which led to him driving off for that night. A week passed by and I was no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sent me a news article via text. I opened it and saw that the man who had been following me 
was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city, all along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He'd gotten caught because he'd followed a university student all the way to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him, surprisingly. He got out the next day, I believe, and was arrested a few more times, put on restrictions even. Couldn't be out of his parents' house between certain hours and unaccompanied by either parent, before he was deported altogether. I didn't keep up with the news on him much more after that. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door in our house. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. And those doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider and obvious main entrance at the front. It didn't make much sense to use that entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who might want to visit using it. As I approached the back door slowly, I could see two tall men in the window, standing right outside. A chill went down my spine. I didn't feel safe just opening the door, so I called out instead. Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Oh, uh, yes, hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but we weren't having any issues with it. Needless to say, I was very confused. Uh, we're not having any issues at the moment. Is there a problem? Ma'am, can we come in? We're servicing the entire area and it's very important we look at your cable. We're not having any issues, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our jobs. I noticed the man was now grabbing the doorknob quite fiercely and trying to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it close to the chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice. You don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to whisper to each other for a moment, then straighten up. Ma'am, let us in right now. We're on a deadline and we need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, and I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am, ma'am, open up! I saw him try the doorknob once more. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude that I'd remembered to lock my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Can I at least get your names and badge numbers? I'll give your supervisor a call to let them know everything is fine. I heard a bunch of shuffling outside. Then one of the men replied, No need, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time tonight. With that, both of the men ran down the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't grip my phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank down to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the cable company and spoke to a representative who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked all our neighbors if they'd had a visit as well, but no one had heard anything. I was recently reminded of a not-so-fun moment that happened last year. At the time, I, 24 and female, had the entire lower-slash-main floor unit I lived in to myself. I used to bartend-slash-manage a nightclub a few blocks away, and would usually get home around 4 a.m. or so. This night, I had just finished a 12-hour shift. I was exhausted and quite hungry, so I decided to simply order some food. I placed the order, got my joint rolled and ready for when the food arrived, and put on a movie to wait. Eventually, I heard the doorbell ring. Being alone and it being quite late at night, I wanted to get the photos sent to the delivery app to verify my food was actually at the door. 
I really didn't want to have to make small talk with the driver, as post-COVID, I still kept the option for contactless delivery. Three to five minutes passed by. I got the photo of the food on the doorstep and decided to get up and go get it finally. My bedroom window had five large windows that gave me my full view of the path along the house, the main street in front, our garbage area, and the area right in front of our unit's door. I could see the driver was surprisingly still out there. Now he started texting me to come out and get my food. I told him he left it in a perfect spot, and I'd be out shortly to get it. I told him thanks for delivering it, and that he could go now. At this point, I was just waiting for him to leave. Even though marijuana is legal here, people can still be a bit judgmental. I didn't want to go out in my PJs to collect my food, smoke, and see another human after working all night. He didn't leave, though, no matter how long I waited. He kept on texting me to come outside. Now, as well, I could hear him talking to another male voice. My window view was unfortunately obscuring the other person, though. The food in the photo had been right against my door, but I could see him slowly moving it away and off to the side, so I'd have to fully go out and walk around a small corner to collect it. I kept texting him, telling me it was fine. I was glad he'd followed the instructions and then he could leave now and I'd be out shortly. He began to bang on the front door, still whispering to this other male voice. He moved my food even further away and wouldn't stop banging and demanding me to come outside. Eventually, I lied and told him I had COVID and I didn't want him to get sick. After I saw he'd read my message on the app, he put my food right back in front of the front door and walked out through the back parking lot even though initially he'd come in through the front. Something about the entire encounter felt so off. I waited for 15 minutes until I couldn't see or hear anyone. I quickly opened the door and grabbed my food. The entire ordeal lasted an hour. My food was nice and cold, of course. The joint was out away for another day, and my heart was racing for the rest of the night. Last year, I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We had been there a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city, which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing about Uber, though, is it allows very cheap and flexible transport, but it opens the door for quite a lot of creeps. I've had Uber drivers who are super cool, of course, but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're so impressive. It's always the worst once an attractive woman sits in the car. It feels like a lot of creeps think, now that I have her here in this situation where she can't flee, she has to talk and be nice to me. For that very reason, one of the guys of our group always used their phone to call the Uber, so no creep would pick up the ride specifically because a woman ordered it. Some of my friends even used fake male names because of this. The guy we got this day was by far the worst. It was late in the evening. An Uber picked us up and drove me, 27 and male, my friend, also 27 and male, and two female friends to the desired old town, where we planned to go clubbing and drink a bit. While driving, the driver was constantly staring at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. He kept on trying to start conversations as well, only talking to the girls and completely ignoring the guys. The girls gave short, non-detailed answers, of course. To us, he seemed way too pushy. He also didn't seem that big on hygiene, giving off the classic, this exact scenario is why we don't like booking Ubers vibe. Meanwhile, we couldn't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super bad situation. Boy, did it not feel great, though, when this guy did not stop on the road, but instead pulled into a parking spot. He startled to fumble with his phone. We thought it was pretty weird and left, thinking the guy would just leave. To our surprise, though, he turned his car off and started to follow us. Just started walking right alongside us without saying a single word. After 400 feet, we reached the gates. We stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group who had taken a separate car. It was around this point that we realized the guy was following a short distance behind us, and he stopped with us as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking? 
This guy was just kind of standing next to it staring at us because people wouldn't let him in. We started making conversation about how long the others would take to get here, where they were right now, etc. The guy started to get very annoyed, apparently. He thought he was part of the posse or something. Oh, cool, even more people. Must be a great evening you've got planned. We texted our friends in the group chat that we were changing the meeting place to this bar. The Uber driver was just following us around. One of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They were very small with lots of people. We took turns at every corner, trying to lose the guy, but he kept on chasing after us. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of other people packed closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost the guy. Finally, we could just head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other half of our group. Two hours passed by and life was very good, we decided to head to another bar a bit further away, because drinks and prices kinda sucked at this one. We'd had two drinks in that bar, when guess who walked right through the door and stood next to the table? The Uber guy. Hello ladies, what's up? At this point, a friend who was good at communicating and very big, told the guy that he wanted to keep to ourselves. We had no interest in hanging out with this man. The guy held his hands up, no problem, and he left. Unfortunately, around 3 a.m. while dancing in a crowd, the same man announced his presence by tenderly grabbing the back of one of the girls we had been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognized the guy, got angry as fuck, and grabbed him by the collar. He told him that if he kept following us, we would beat the shit out of him. The bouncer saw this and approached as well. I started talking to the bouncer. At first, he was super annoyed by having to deal with a fight. But after hearing how this guy had stalked us all the way to the club from his car, he asked a few follow-up questions and then proceeded to throw the man out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us again. After that, we reported him for being a creep in the app and called another Uber, which thankfully was not him. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my very first apartment. It was a small bachelor apartment in a fairly sketchy area. I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough. I knew how to handle myself because of this and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar. A lot of the customers would stand outside to smoke. When they did, they would always be looking at my apartment. Most of the people who were out smoking kept to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I happened to be there. Never really any issues, until one evening. One evening, I arrived home from work and passed by the bar, where I saw an extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed by, I could feel him staring at me. I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me at all just continued to stare. It was a bit weird, but I didn't really think that much of it. Maybe he was just lost in thought or something. About an hour later, though, I heard a sudden knock at my door. This was very odd because you had to buzz people into the building. The building only had eight units, and I didn't really know any of the neighbors, so I had no idea who this could be. I froze because I really didn't want to talk to anyone, but the knocking continued. Finally, I called out. Who is it? There was no response. I called out again. Who's there? It's me. It's Tom. I didn't know anyone named Tom, so I shouted back. I don't know anyone called that. You must have the wrong apartment. What he said next chilled me. You may not know me, but I sure know you. Open up. We can talk a bit. I went over to the peephole and saw it was that tall man from the bar. Fuck off or I'm calling the cops. I heard his footsteps walk away slightly. Then I heard the building door open and close. At least he left without much fuss. Or so I thought. A few minutes later, I peeked out the window, only to see he was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be whispering something to himself, walking around and looking crazed. At this point, I was freaking out. I called my landlord who lived in the building next to me. 
He told me to call the police, and in the meantime, he and his brother would come to check things out. I called the cops and told them what was happening. They said a car was on the way. Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother made their way to the parking lot. I watched out the window and saw them approach the tall man. He took one look at them and bolted into the night. My landlord and his brother tried to chase him, but the man got away. About five minutes later, the police arrived. I gave my version of events and also a description of the man. The officer then told me this. We've had reports of a man matching that description who's been sexually assaulting women in the area. Thank God you didn't open the door. A few days later, I got a call from the officer. He told me part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar. The owner called the police when the tall dude reappeared after a few days, and the police responded and swiftly arrested him. I used to fight with my parents a lot as a teenager. That led to them kicking me out once I graduated high school. I was almost 19 at that point. For me, that wasn't much of a problem. I had my own job, my own cheap car, and my friend's parents had a spare bedroom. They were willing to let me rent out for a while. It worked out just fine for me. This being said, I will change all the names. Let's call my friend Kelly and her mom Lena. Her dad is Kenneth. Kenneth and Lena had a lot of weird friends due to the fact they were quite fierce partiers. A lot of these friends were genuinely nice people, just a little bit weird. You could tell they had issues such as drugs or criminal pasts. But none of them were bad or mean or creepy or anything like that. There was one particular guy though that was just beyond weird. Just someone who, even though I didn't know him at all, he made my skin crawl the moment I looked at him. We'll call him Joey. I came home from work one day, and the only person there at our house was Joey. As soon as I walked in, he said hello, then made some comment about how beautiful I was. I don't consider myself good looking in the slightest, so I just kind of said thanks and walked off to start doing my normal routine. As I was making my lunch and cleaning up my mess, I could feel someone staring at me from behind. It was Joey. He'd followed me into the kitchen and was now blocking the only doorway, just standing there watching me. I asked him if I could get him anything, but he shook his head and continued to watch me. This made me very uncomfortable, of course. I kinda shoved him out of the way and fled for my room. I locked the door until I heard everyone else get home. Joey finally left around dinner time. I thought it was fine and went about my nightly routine and went to bed as usual. He must have come back at some point though because he was sitting at the breakfast table when I went down to get my cereal. Again, the whole time he just stared daggers at me, so I took my food to my room instead. Friday night rolled around. Lena, Kenneth, and Kelly told me they were going to throw this huge party and I should invite whoever I wanted. I just had a gut feeling though that Joey was going to be there. I invited the most intimidating male person I could think of, my neighbor Charles. He was a pretty huge guy, around six foot five or so. He was also covered nearly head to toe in tattoos and happened to be an ex-Hells Angel. He was the type that, unless provoked, wouldn't hurt anybody. I explained by inviting him the day before about how Joey was behaving. What he told me scared the shit out of me. Turns out he actually knew Joey. Apparently, he was on the run from the police for raping some teenage girls the year before and said I needed to stay as far away from him as possible no matter what. You'd think that would be where the scary part ended, but no, it gets worse. I'm usually not a cop caller myself since I can hang with an unsavory crowd sometimes, but I went straight home, packed all my things, left to a safe place, and called the police. Here's the worst part. When they finally arrested him, they took a look through his phone. I don't know how the hell he managed this, but he had multiple pictures of me on it. Most of them were of me sleeping, or me in the shower or using the bathroom. He had texts to another person about me, and about what they were planning to do with me when he got the opportunity. I no longer talk to Kelly or her parents, and when someone gives me a bad vibe, I instantly get away from them. 
I'll forever be grateful to Charles as well, because he might have just saved my life by letting me know all that. America Online was a big thing when I was 13 years old. In other words, from my generation, AIM, which stood for, you guessed it, AOL Instant Messenger. It was around 2002 or so, and I would have been freshly 13 in an 8th grade. I had many times gone into chat rooms by myself or with my friends to goof around. Unfortunately, unsolicited photos were a big thing then, too. Usually, you could at least stay clear of it by taking note of the chat rooms you entered, though. I didn't have any photos of myself back then, because you had to take a digital photo and upload it from your camera. Plus, I was 13 and quite self-conscious, which I'm sure anyone else can relate to. One day, though, a guy popped up on my screen, wanting to chat. It went fine at first. I was extremely naive back then and we quickly fell into a pattern of talking. This guy's name was Dave, and he lived in California. Of course, this escalated into him eventually telling me he loved me and all that sort of thing. Problem was, he was 19. I'm not proud of this exactly, but being 13, I sent some pictures of a random girl I found online and told him that was me. He instantly fell for me telling me how age was just a number and how mature I was. At this point, he said he did not live in state, so there was never any chance of us meeting, really. Eventually, though, he told me he and his mom were moving to a city that was about an hour and a half away from me. He began to beg me to come see him, to go to a movie, to do anything with him. At this point, I broke the catfishing truth and told him those were not pictures of me, but of someone else entirely. He was furious, of course. He had been looking forward to a different type of child this whole time. A few days later, though, he forgave me, saying he still wanted to meet with me because he loved me. All the things you'd say to a young girl to get her to swoon. It's strange to think back and see how naive you were when you're a teenager. I told my best friend everything. I explained everything that happened and that I wanted her to go with me to meet him. There was a whole plan about him driving to see me and going to the movies to finally meet what I thought was the love of my life. I had been completely brainwashed into believing this was normal. I also didn't tell my mom, of course. Honestly, she didn't notice anything was wrong. She'd never been too involved if you catch my drift. The day of, my friend and I were going to meet up with Dave. Her mom came and picked us up from school. Out of nowhere, she said something that made my stomach drop into nothingness. Chrissy, you're not going to the movies. You're not going to meet that man. You're going to get seriously hurt or kidnapped and I can't allow you to go. I cried and cried because I honestly thought I could handle everything myself and be completely fine. She told me she was at least not going to tell my mom though. All I had to do was promise to never speak with Dave again and never plan to meet another stranger online. Dave actually ended up showing up and got quite angry that I wasn't there. He went on aim, flying off the handle like I hadn't seen at that age. It really scared me. It scared me how suddenly he changed and how close this man was to being near me. Dave never talked to me again after. I easily believe, though, I would have been kidnapped or worse that day if my best friend's mom hadn't stepped in. My mom would have been none the wiser. I was none the wiser already. But here I am today after having learned a dire lesson. Nobody is what they seem online. Make sure to keep your kids close. This happened about 10 years ago. I was in graduate school at the time, working on my master's degree for clinical social work. My practicum was at a confidential shelter, which housed women and children seeking shelter from domestic violence. Since I was only an intern, I worked quite a lot of late night shifts. After closing up at the shelter, I started to head home. It was well after midnight, and because of this, the roads were all fairly empty. 
I lived in a smaller town at the time, so this was not entirely unusual. As I approached the stoplight, though, I noticed a man stumbling a few yards away, walking towards the crosswalk. I suddenly got a very anxious and unsettling feeling. Immediately, I locked my car doors. Mind you, this was before I had a car with automatic door locks. I usually drove without ever locking my car doors, as I never felt unsafe while doing so. I felt better after having locked my doors this time, though, and pulled up to the red light all alone. Staring ahead at the light, I noticed the man never crossed the street. I glanced to my right where I had seen him earlier, only to come face to face with his face pressed right up against my passenger side window. I screamed and honked my horn and told the man to go away. Instead, he continued standing there, staring through my window at me. Then he tried the handle of the door without success. I continued screaming at him, honking my horn and waiting for the red light to change. The man straightened up weirdly, stepped away from the passenger side door, and quickly moved to my driver side door, trying the handle once more. When that failed, he took a wide stance next to my car, as though he was about to lunge. He began to smack his hands against my window. At that moment, I thought to myself, screw this. I slammed the gas to run the red light. The man kind of stumbled back when I did this. I think I must have ran over his foot accidentally in my escape. When I arrived home, I woke up my husband to tell him, and he called the police. The police, of course, never found the man, as by the time they'd sent someone out, he was long gone. The police officer did commend me for running the red light, though, as well as for potentially running over the man's foot. This story contains stalking, unwanted recording, and threats. Back when I was much smaller, I used to have a friend named Billy and his older brother, Jack. There was a neighbor up above on a hill down the road from their house who was normally very reclusive. As a friend who just came over every other weekend, I wasn't really aware of his existence at first. One night, I heard a creaking on their balcony outside while I was sleeping over in the living room. The living room had three large windows facing the balcony next to the street and the door to the left. I was having a bit of trouble sleeping since me and the friends had been staying up playing horror games. I peeked out the window for a moment only to see a flash of light coming from the balcony. Understandably, I flipped the fuck out. The parents came running and sprinted out onto the balcony where they caught a glimpse of a man sprinting away into the night. We stayed up the rest of the night eating snacks kind of vibing together while all quite scared. The next weekend I was there, a man showed up at the door with a camera, recording us without us knowing for a few minutes. The father noticed and went out, and started yelling at the man as he followed him up the road. The police were called as well. I'll admit, the father maybe hadn't handled this the best, but we were all pretty stressed out, and it was becoming quite a lot to deal with. The man was then identified as Daniel Vincent Kelly. The next weekend, we saw the man down in the far distance in a large parking lot we could see nearby a lake. He was just riding his bike shirtless in circles under a large spotlight, looking up at the house the entire time. We were understandably horrified. The man was very clearly mentally ill. He vanished from under the spotlight, and for the remainder of the night, we were holed up by the windows with weapons, just in case he tried to record us or break in. The next weekend, we were woken up in the middle of the night to a loud noise once more. We found his bike, sitting up against the edge of the house on the property. We all grabbed weapons and kept an eye out that night. We contacted the authorities again. It was around this point the cops found Daniel Vincent Kelly and informed us of a YouTube channel they discovered he had. This is the most chilling part to me by far, and the part that gives me extreme anxiety at night, almost every time I see a window. The most harrowing videos have long since been deleted due to legal troubles with being non-consensually filmed, but I did find a remaining video. He walks around and claims that a hole in their screen door, which I can verify never existed, had allowed their dog to escape and attack his dog. 
He claimed that within just a few minutes, my friend's mother replaced the screen on the door and was covering the incident up. This was all obviously false. The deleted videos, though, make me sick to think about. There were at least 30 videos of him secretly recording us, some from long before my first encounter with him. One, I remember even, was vividly in broad daylight, but I'd never seen him. He was just laying down behind a hill, holding his phone up just over it, recording us, calling me and my friend disgusting piglets as we played together on the porch. At least ten of his videos featured me, but almost all of them featured my friend. Some of them even had him uttering threats to kill us, which was terrifying. Sadly, I wasn't allowed over the following weeks, and I don't know how the incident really ended. I do know I never saw Kelly again. I don't know if he got arrested or simply moved away. I wouldn't exactly like to search through his now inactive channel to find out, though. Hi. This happened only a few hours ago, so I'm shaken, but it's too early in the morning to phone and wake up friends. I needed to just share this and get this out. Brief setting and context. I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents. This means staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home for the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed also faces that window. I often leave this particular window open at night, since I need it to be cool to sleep. I haven't really worried about it, since there is a cabinet with an aquarium in front of that window area. It didn't block the view since it was see-through. I could also reach to open and close it fairly easily. It would make it difficult for someone to climb inside, though. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's usually sweet-natured and a medium-sized dog who doesn't really look threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any and all noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. After tonight, I won't be able to leave that window open again. It started maybe 3.30 or 4 a.m. sometime. I was still awake. Since I'm caring for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns, and I'm awake at odd hours of the night. I was just reading a book when I heard Sable growl low and deep. She jumped off the bed and began to pace around, looking up at the window. Then she jumped up at the cabinet right by it. I called out just in case someone was actually there. Hey, we're calling the police. This dog does bite. I went to look out the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything, though. I pulled them shut once more and made sure they were completely closed, tucking them down as well so any wind wouldn't be able to move them. I wasn't really alarmed yet, though. It's a fairly quiet residential street, true, but there are some foxes around me sometimes here and occasionally someone will pass by or the neighbor's gate next door will make a squeaking sound or something. Usually, though, she wouldn't react the way she did this time. She'd usually growl but stay on the bed. Her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if someone was scoping out the open window to potentially burgle, they'd seen now the room was occupied by an awake person and a dog. Surely they'd go find an easier target. I was wrong, though. It was a good half hour or more later, after I'd relaxed a bit and thought I might doze off soon. When she began to growl once more, this time much more serious, I listened again, thinking it must be some foxes or something. Then, though, I heard what sounded like deep, horror-movie-type breathing noises, the kind of heavy breathing sounds someone might make down the phone when stalking someone in a film. I sat up and looked at the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom. Someone was peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted once again and moved from the bed to the side of the window. I could just barely see past the curtain. I saw the figure of a man moving away from the window to the right, towards the front door and exit of the front garden. It was too dark to make out many features, just the dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached over and pulled it shut. I grabbed my phone and called emergency services. One thing that really creeps me out in hindsight 
is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window. That was after I'd shouted, and he knew he'd been seen as well. Still, though, he stayed there, knowing I'd already seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out the window fully. Only then did he move away. It was like he was purposely trying to frighten me. While on the phone with police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning all the lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure. It was, thankfully. Very careful to lock doors and other windows at night. Everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5 a.m. and took a report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they had camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow. They went to drive around the area and search. Since the dark meant I'd only seen the shape of a person with no real description, I doubt they can do much, though. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man. The breathing and the figure made me instantly think of a man, though. The outline of his head was also smooth. So he was either bald or wearing some sort of skin-tight cap. I'm very shaken, angry, and violated. I really wish we have a camera system now. I'll be looking into that for sure. I never thought anything like this would happen. I don't have any enemies, no bad exes, no one I know harboring any grudges. Since I'm caring for my folks full time now, I barely even get the chance to socialize. My elderly and disabled parents surely don't have any enemies either. I also don't consider myself very attractive, so not a likely target for a peeping Tom either. If it wasn't for the fact that my dog alerted me to something both times, I'd have wondered whether I was half asleep or dreamed it all, that I'd imagined it. I have to think it was someone who was looking to burgle a house or something. But why did they hang around for so long then? Maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode? Maybe someone who just wanted to scare me. But why? And who? They know where we live for sure. I'm wondering if they're going to come back. New fears keep on popping into my mind. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back garden with only a small side gate. It's not designed to keep others out. It would be very easy for someone to access and then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view this time. They were bold enough to stick around even knowing I knew they were there. Perhaps they were hoping I'd just forget and fall asleep or something. I don't know, but it's pretty scary. This is maybe not as scary as some others you've heard, but this experience has been ingrained in my mind. I was about five or six years old. I went to my local kindergarten, and I was as carefree as a child can be. The greatest of my worries was my mom forgetting to pick me up from school. She never did, though. Every day we walked from school to home and vice versa, since it was a good walking distance. We lived in a compound that was kind of secluded, and mostly inhabited by old people or boarding students who went to university nearby. This morning started out like any other. My mom picked me up, and we were walking along the small path in our compound, along with four other people, three high schoolers, two of which were walking together, and a female college student. She was holding a handkerchief over her head because of the heat. The sun was high up and glaring. It was the middle of the day. You wouldn't expect anything to happen. But surely enough, it did. We were quite far back from this group when I turned around and saw a man had suddenly joined us. He was clearly not from here. He had a bright neon green bag in front of him, which was slightly opened, one of his hands tucked inside. His clothes were kind of dusty, but the most eerie thing was how deeply he was glaring at us. It was just the five of us walking in this quiet area. My little self didn't really think much of it, until my mom firmly squeezed my hand and started to walk much faster. At first, I was very confused. I knew the only thing that could trigger this was danger behind us. It must have come from the form of that stranger who was now following us closely behind. I tried to look back discreetly. The man was now glaring hatefully at all of us, getting closer and closer. I looked at my mom to ask what was going on, but her low, worried murmurs didn't really translate well for me. My ears did pick up on the word knife, though. That's when I felt my stomach drop. As a child, you only ever watch scary situations happening on TV, never really thinking you'd be in any real danger. But now I was. 
My stupid little legs weren't going fast enough. Factor in my mom's older age. She was around 50 at the time, compared to our other companions, and we were clearly the easiest target. We were also at the back, too. Luckily, our house was still nearby. I couldn't resist looking back. The man was getting closer and closer, shortening the distance between us. I remember thinking about how I wanted to scream for help, desperately looking around at all these houses that were empty. My mom's firm grip kept me going. At least we lived here, too. I never really knew if the others were aware of this man as well. One of the high schoolers walked quickly to a house over nearby the basketball court and further down the path. The pair veered off into a different trail that led to the main highway. This meant it was just us and the female college student left behind. At this point, the man was walking very fast, catching up bit by bit. Our apartment was only a few steps away. My mom and I began to sprint toward it, up the stairs and into the comfort of our own home. Right as we reached the door, the man gave us one last glare. He looked like he wanted to stop for a moment, but instead kept on walking. My heart was pounding against my chest. My mom left me to lock the door while she stared out the window. She kept on repeating, He has a knife. I saw it. He's holding a knife. I ran towards the window and caught a glimpse of that college girl, still clutching that handkerchief over her head. She was now looking behind her in fear and alarm as the man started to follow her quite quickly, his bright bag in front of him, now wide open, his hands still inside. He was getting closer and closer. I couldn't watch any more after. I don't know what happened, only my mom's recollection of the events. She had noticed the man suddenly coming up behind us. Her suspicions were raised when he hadn't tried to walk past us like the others, but instead maintained a close distance between us. Then she saw the knife hidden away in his bag. He gripped it as he stared at all of us. I really hope the girl is okay and that the man didn't do anything. It's been years now and I don't really know where to start to find out. I don't really know if I'd like to as well. Sometimes I wonder what that girl must have been feeling. This is a real story that absolutely traumatized me and my boyfriend. Two years ago, I moved to the UK for university, as I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents. The situation at home was a bit too toxic for me. In first year at uni, I moved into a student accommodation and met some really great people actually. It was a pretty good year without even meeting my boyfriend yet, who I'm still with to this day. I was just enjoying my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. Anyhow, second year came by and I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations. At least we'd have our own house though and weren't as restricted with noise and parties and such. Note, I had a ground floor room and my window looked into a very small backyard in which I would go and smoke every day as I'm a smoker. There was a very thin wooden door going to the other side of the street where you would put your bins and broken chairs and that sort of thing. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard. Since it was an old door, we had to attach some extra things to keep it closed for good though. I had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right side of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university. They were, needless to say, very strange. I even had a moment where I met one of them outside our house one day because of police intervention due to one of their flatmates attacking him and the others with a kitchen knife and burning their kitchen down. I heard some screams and rushed outside with my flatmates, only to see one of them covered in blood and cuts everywhere on his arm, a wound on his head inflicted by the knife as well. We didn't know what to do, so we offered him our help to clean himself and gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We saw the guy who'd attacked them all being escorted out by the police and into a van driven off to be arrested. I don't really know anything more about that story. The police didn't tell us anything else, but it was quite strange needless to say. Anyway, the guy we helped was quite weird as well. He often kept trying to grab me and hold me for some reason. We noticed when helping him he smoked quite a lot of marijuana too. 
We didn't really care about that at the moment, though. We just wanted to make sure he was okay, as we didn't really know him. After some time had passed, I went back to university. When I came home, I would see him quite often just standing in the street. I never said a word to him. One day, though, he came up to me when I went to the corner shop and started talking to me. I didn't really feel comfortable talking to him, so I just didn't respond. Oh, that's how you want to do it. Okay, I'll just wait out in front of your house then, and we can talk then. I was very creeped out. I thought at first he was just joking. I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street. As I turned to where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep and waiting for me. I panicked and went back to the corner shop. I called my only male flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell the guys to go away. Unfortunately, he was not home, and no one else was either. I literally had to just wait it out until I saw them finally leave one hour later. I sprinted back home while they weren't looking and locked the front door. After this already scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy, and mostly I succeeded for a while. One day, though, as I went smoking in the backyard, I noticed the wooden door, which had always been closed before, was now open. The things we'd used to keep it closed had been sliced through. For whatever reason, this didn't initially startle me that much. I simply closed the door again and put some new things on it, thinking it must have been one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back or something. Another thing to note is that those weird neighbors would often scream and yell in their house in the middle of the night. It would always wake us up, but we got kind of used to it after a while. One evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did. He, who usually never wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a sudden bang and some whispered murmuring. I was still sound asleep, so he very silently woke me up. We waited in the dark together and listened for any other noises. Suddenly, we heard the wooden door shoot open with a bang and footsteps right next to my window. We both froze in place. We heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly, as if they were trying to get inside. Then they stopped. Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us. We were ready to get dressed and get the fuck out of the room, though. Just then, we heard my window begin to move and open. One of the people outside said something in a different language we didn't understand and we could hear them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I shot up out of bed, grabbed my phone, put our clothes on, and ran out of the house. I called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms. Then I called the police. Luckily, they came in less than five minutes, as the headquarters were only a couple of streets down from us. I don't really remember anything after the police came. I think we were both in shock. They ended up only catching one guy. The other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking some weed. The police told us they went inside of their house, found a lot of meth and heroin. They were also carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was confused, as I'd never done anything to offend them, nor done anything wrong to any of my neighbors. The idea of them breaking in with God knows what intentions with a knife to terrorize me and my boyfriend startled me quite a bit. The two guys ended up being arrested, one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intent to harm. I never heard anything else from the police. I moved back home a few months later as I was really scared. It tormented me for months on end, not knowing what would have happened to me if my boyfriend didn't wake up. I'm now still coping with it and finding it really tough to get over it. I always wake up at the slightest noise and get horrible noises because of it. At least my boyfriend is still awesome though. We often talk about it together, and it helps quite a lot. What I'm about to describe to you might possibly sound like a cheap-ass cliché movie script, but this did indeed happen. Even at home, barely anybody believes me without confirmation from all of the other parties involved. Autumn 2019 in British Columbia, Canada. I'm from Germany, but spent half a year in Canada as part of my bachelor's degree. I just barely managed to get back before COVID hit. I was 22 years old at the time, and the other people involved were about the same age. Another one of the foreign exchange students and I befriended this local Canadian student. 
We all had the same interests and humor, and we all became very good friends. He told us all about the local area, and we spent a summer with him and his father at their very remote cabin near some woods. They taught us how to handle guns there, and let us shoot a lot as well. When fall came, we had a lot of free time, due to being finished with all our papers. Our buddy proposed that we spend a few days at his dad's cabin, this time without dad around. We went, hell yeah, we could load up on booze and weed and have a great time there, just living it up. Three close-ass dudes in the woods, gaming and getting wasted. Sounds great, right? After loading up on all our supplies, the first three days were very good. On the first day, just like the last time I was there, I could barely sleep a wink and was generally tense. This is because I'm a naturally very paranoid guy, and I always go into alert mode in various situations. This is often mocked by my friends because nothing ever happened. In this case, what was freaking me out the most was the fact we were so far away from civilization. You never really understand how quiet surroundings can be until you spend some time in a remote area like this. This led to me often just standing in the dark at night, listening to the surroundings of the cabin. After the first few days, I got used to it and got less paranoid. After all, I was with my best friends. I was also constantly high, and we were quite armed and dangerous as well. Probably the most dangerous to ourselves, honestly. Day four came by, though. We spent the day attempting to hunt in the woods. Mostly that entailed chilling under trees with a beer and rifle in hand. In the evening, it started to rain quite heavily. After an hour, we were starting to see lightning in the distance even. There was quite a bit of time passing between lightning and thunder though, which meant the thunderstorm itself was still quite some ways away. We aborted our incompetent hunting attempts and started trekking our way back to the cabin. It took us about an hour to reach it, due to it already being very dark and the rain creating unsafe footing. For context, you should know that once you've spent a few days in the wilderness and haven't seen a soul other than your friends for days, you can become quite careless about your surroundings. We entered the cabin. By the time we'd arrived back, the thunderstorm was full raging. We put away our gear and changed our clothes, except for our guns. We cozied down in the living room at the table and started a YouTube video and began to play cards together. Barely 20 minutes had passed since we returned. At the time, we didn't bother closing the curtains in the living room because thunderstorms are baller as fuck. So just imagine, three guys sitting around a table laughing in an awe at the weather outside while playing cards together. In such a remote place, it was extremely dark outside. Without a full moon or clear skies, it was pitch black. My friend initially saw this. While sipping from his beer, a flash of lightning went off. He spit it out after the lightning came down. He screamed loudly and stood up. No words, just the sound of panic. There's somebody outside! He started rambling about how in that split second, the lightning illuminated the outside of the cabin. He'd seen a person standing in the distance, hiding behind a tree and looking directly at us. This is what I meant when I said cliché horror. My non-local friend was in full-on panic. He was quite anxious. I grabbed my rifle and pulled the ball to rack around into the chamber. I felt that warm sensation down my spine of my body releasing adrenaline. I tried to stay far away from the window and stared out into the darkness outside. Of course, I couldn't see anything. While our Canadian friend rushed into his room to grab his pistol, I started panicking even more because I realized we'd never lock the door. Why would we? We hadn't seen anyone in days and were in the middle of nowhere. I sprinted to the door to lock it. Our friend returned with his pistol, which he'd grabbed because there was a flashlight attached to it. He carefully approached the window and opened it with one hand, the other aiming the gun outside. His flashlight turned on in the darkness. Immediately, it illuminated a man, tall and slim, dressed in all black, in a hooded raincoat which he'd pulled over his face. He was not far away from the cabin, just a few steps away from the window. He was not standing behind something as our friend had yelled earlier, but seemed to be crouching. He looked directly at us and clenched his eyes. He had a terrifying smirk on one side of his mouth. Another lightning flashed, and for that moment we were all frozen. Nobody said anything for a few moments. It's hard to explain the dreadful feeling about seeing something like this, in a storm in the middle of nowhere. 
a person dressed in all black crouching and approaching you. Our Canadian buddy was aiming his pistol at the frozen, crouched, smirking man. He yelled out with a slight stutter. Get the fuck away from us! We will shoot! I guess after that moment, his eyes adjusted. The raincoat man realized it was not just a flashlight, but a gun as well. I was standing next to my friend with a hunting rifle of my own. The raincoat man's smirk changed to something I'm unsure of. It was either shock or rage. All this happened in less than a minute. My friend kept on yelling. The raincoat man turned about 90 degrees towards the nearest tree line. He went from a crouch to sprinting like an Olympic runner. He ran away to the right side of our window. The two of us poked our head out the window to see where he was going. In the heavy rainfall and darkness, though, we couldn't make out anything. After a few moments of just looking at each other in disbelief, we decided to pop off a few rounds outside to prove that the guns were real and to cope with our own fear. When the shock wore off, we called the police. They asked a lot of questions on the phone to describe the location of the cabin and a description of the man who'd almost crept up on us, totally unsuspecting, only revealed due to a lucky strike of lightning. Due to us being in a remote area, the cops told us it'd take at least two hours for someone to come. Given how the man saw that we were armed, he probably wouldn't come back again. We agreed. We discussed just jumping in the truck and leaving right now. Us dumbasses had been too lazy to refuel it, though. The idea of doing this now in the dark and the heavy rain was just too frightening. We spent the night sleeping in shifts. One person awake standing guard. The others at least attempted to sleep. When my turn came, the rain had died down. I turned off all the lights, opened a window, and sat there in the darkness. It was close to the middle of the next day when two cops arrived. We gave them a detailed report of what happened, when it happened, and had to show them which direction the man had run off to. They said they'd organize a patrol to comb through the woods, but that might take a while. Sadly, we hadn't seen any details of the man's face. We couldn't tell if he was old or young, only that he was tall and clean-shaven. The chances of finding who he was or what the hell he was attempting to do were slim to none. One of the officers, though, expressed that this was deeply worrying. We left the cabin a few hours after the police left. The guy's dad insisted we stay at his place for at least a day until we felt safe again. He also wanted to hear every last detail. I never heard from those cops again. Next January, I left Canada and returned home. My Canadian friend was called in for an interview a few months later, though. It seemed like the police were still seriously investigating this, looking for the guy who'd crept up on the cabin during a thunderstorm. We've speculated a lot about what this was. Winning theory is that the guy most certainly had sinister intentions. It didn't look like just an attempted burglary. Remember, we had dim lights on so you could see there was somebody inside. The guy was also creeping during a thunderstorm. I suspect the raincoat man wanted to check what kind of victim was on the menu. I really don't want to imagine what he had in mind if we were two unarmed girls instead of a pair of armed guys in a cabin in the middle of nowhere. We hadn't seen any headlights during our stay there, and the guy also had no backpack or any gear. I'd bet my soul because of this that this guy was a man on a mission, who knew exactly what he was doing and was well prepared for it. I've been having a super lousy few months, and this is kind of just the shit cherry on top. I was walking back from work yesterday to meet my spouse at home, where we have an apartment together. It's getting dark earlier again these days, so it was quite close to fully dark as I was walking through. I'm always on edge when I walk alone already, so I had my key lanyard in my hand. I noticed right away when a guy came out from a side street and crossed the road to walk alongside me. I was already going at a brisk pace and was just a block and a half away from home. As I passed underneath a streetlight, the man called out to me. I ignored him. He called out again. I ignored once more. He began to get quite angry. What's your problem? Without turning around or slowing down, I just shouted out I wasn't interested over my shoulder and walked even faster. The man got even angrier though. Don't be such a bitch. He sounded extremely angry. At this point, I just thought to myself, man, fuck this. I'm not dealing with this tonight. I broke out into a sprint down the street toward my building. The man screamed after me, 
and I heard his feet pounding on the sidewalk behind me. I made it to the front door of my building, yanked the door open, and slammed it shut. I jammed my key into the locked lobby entrance, yanked that open, sped through, and slammed that shut too. The front lobby walls are made of glass, and you could very clearly see inside. I figured having these locked doors would deter him. I speed walk through the lobby anyway into the stairs just in case. A few male neighbors I'm acquainted and friendly with were sitting in the lobby chatting. I waved and said hi to them. I guess I'm very lucky they were there. The locked door didn't stop him at all. Instead, I heard a massive shattering smash. I nearly shit my heart out and my neighbors started yelling. I whipped around to see that this asshole had kicked or punched the door in, shattering most of it. He was now trying to reach through and let himself in. I shouted to the neighbors, That man followed me here! I don't know him! I booked it up the stairs and ran all the way to my apartment. I could hear shouting and fighting, even when I got into my place. I told my spouse right away what happened. We called 911 as well. The cops came to our building and one spoke to me briefly. A search was conducted for the man, who'd apparently run away when he saw my neighbors angry and approaching him. We got a follow-up visit a couple of hours later for a different cop. Turns out the dumbass had cut himself on the door, so it was easy to grab him once they found out who he was. Apparently, this wasn't his first time hanging around my complex. He was known to the cops as an addict who followed people around asking for money. He was also suspected of buying from dealers in our complex, but had never been caught. How unlucky for him, I guess. I guess I shouldn't even be surprised, though. It's not a good place, not a good building, just something we can afford until we can move on to better. For fuck's sake, though, I'm so tired of living that way. This happened Sunday night. I got into a very huge fight with my mom. It was very emotional and intense, to say the very least. We made up and said goodnight to each other, blah blah blah, but I was still very pissed off. In my impulsive mood, I decided I was going to take off for the night. I just wanted to cool off for a bit, really. I went into my backyard and hopped over one of our walls and started to walk around. Mind you, it was midnight and I'm a teenage girl that's quite on the skinny side. It was also a not so well lit area. I didn't even have my phone in case something happened or a weapon for self-protection, which was quite stupid of me, honestly. For a bit more layout of the story as well, just down the street from my house, which is a neighborhood road, there's a church and a preschool across from it. In front of the preschool, there are large, tall hedges that sort of hide the pickup and drop-off area that's in front of the school. There's a stop sign on the church's corner before the busy main road, and a street lamp on that same corner. I was making my way down the corner on the church's side. I was very bored and cold, but it's not like I could call a friend to come pick me up and hang out or something. I decided to face the main road and put a hitchhiker's thumb up in hopes of someone pulling into the street and letting me use their phone to call a friend. After what felt like hours and hours, getting no such luck, I saw a guy from across the main road and called out to him. I didn't have any weird feelings about this guy. Actually, he was quite nice and let me use his phone. I still wasn't able to find any of my friends to come and get me, though. Before the man turned to leave, though, he asked me if I had anything on me for protection. He said he was quite worried because I was all alone and it was so late at night. I told him I'd honestly forgotten it at home. He handed me a small, sharp switchblade and told me to keep it and stay safe and to have a good rest of the night. After watching the man walk off into the dark heading east, I wandered up and down the sidewalk as cars passed by. I was just about getting tired of this and started to pass the hedges when I glanced over to the left of me where the school was. In that moment, I saw the large silhouette of a man slowly creeping around the front doors to the small preschool. The man was quite big. He was hidden in the darkness as well. It took me about two seconds to realize the man had stopped in place and had seen me too. I went into flight mode immediately. I immediately noped the hell out of there and ran across the normally busy street. It happened to be empty at that moment. I could hear him sprinting behind me. I kept on running until I was five streets down and realized finally he was not following me anymore. About 30 minutes had gone by. 
I decided it was about time to make my way home. Eventually, I crossed the street and was facing the main road walking down to the church. I took a left and went to get home. It was silent, and no cars had gone by for a few minutes at that point. Then, though, I heard a car speeding down the road. I turned my head back to see a large white Suburban. I dismissed it at first, thinking nothing of it as it turned right a few streets down. I dismissed it at first, thinking nothing of it as it turned right a few streets down across the road. I just started to turn the corner under the street lamp when I looked back up again. I saw that car starting to come out of the same road it had just turned onto. I'm not sure why or how my gut was telling me to run, but I did. I ran into a nearby parking lot. I threw myself on the ground behind a ramp wall that was barely tall enough to hide me. Next thing I knew, I was about to cry because of how freaked out I was. I was trying to stay silent at the same time. I could see the Suburban's headlights reflecting off the walls of the building nearby as it pulled into the parking lot as well. It made a few laps around from what I could sneak a peek of and stopped in the middle for a couple of minutes. Eventually, it turned out and drove into the main road, though. I waited a bit longer and pulled the knife out, listening for anything or everything. Eventually, I realized I was probably in the clear, and I ran back home without further incident. I'm not sure exactly what was going on there, but I'm sure it was up to no good. I would like to share my experience with you all, as it was something that made me change into who I am today. Some info just before that, though. I'm a Brazilian guy, 20 years old today, but I was around 12 or so when this story happened. Just a normal school day, boring subjects, annoying people, you know, the usual. I come from a good family with a somewhat good financial situation, so at the time, I had with me a Motorola V3 cell phone. That was like top tier back in the day, and it was really uncommon for the other kids to have one. Every day after school, it would take a while for my father to pick me up with his car, which used to be a silver Mariva. That was also the same car he would drive me to school with. One day, I was waiting for my dad to come pick me up, so I was playing some new Super Mario Bros on my DS which of course I took to school with me. And that's when I heard my cell phone ring, and I heard the voice of a somewhat cheery man. Hey Pete, it's your Uncle Paul. I'm here to pick you up for Dad. Come outside. I simply answered with okay and left through the gate. Thing is, it was still fairly early, way earlier than my dad usually picks me up. When I thought about that, I went back inside and waited for another call, and it came pretty fast. Where are you? The man asked. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I don't see you. He breathed a heavy sigh and began to give me some instructions. I'm with the same blue Corolla that I dropped you today in the morning, Pete. Come on. He hung up. He was getting impatient. My 12-year-old brain processed what was happening and connected the dots. The thing is, I had no uncles with a name that started with P. Also, it couldn't be my mom's brother either, because he'd been dead for quite a while now. No one called me Pete either but my family, being my brother, sister, and my parents. I started to get a bit nervous and talk to my friends about this. After all, some of them were still there. Basically, all they said was, yeah, dude, that's really sketch. Now, I'm not one to usually take charge myself, so instead I went to the principal for help. On the way there, the man called again, and I picked up. This time, he was angry. Why the fuck are you taking so long, you son of a bitch? Blue Corolla, are you brain dead? Get out here with that stupid video game of yours. Then he hung up. Instantly, I froze, and many thoughts began to rush through my head. Is this a kidnapper or something? Is this a prank? I started running to the principal's office. I was getting nervous, so I called my dad. He answered in a hurry, and I took a deep breath to not seem scared. Hey, uh, Dad, did you by chance send someone named Paul here to pick me up? My heart was pounding to hear what I wanted. No, whoever's calling you, don't go outside. I'll be right there. He hung up after. I went into the office building, bursting in tears, asking for someone to get the man that was probably out there waiting for me in a blue Corolla. I gave the teacher and the principal the number he was calling me from, 
and they called as well to no avail. They decided to go outside together and check this blue Corolla by themselves. I stayed behind in the office as I got more calls. This time I picked up. My hands were shaking, but I knew at least now he could not harm me. What's taking you so long, you little shit? He screamed. Listen, I know you're no uncle of mine. You have no idea which car I come to school in. You're trying to kidnap me or something. I'm not going out there. He whispered something quietly. I couldn't hear him, so I screamed and called him sick and crazy. Again. You're not coming out again. You've been out. You just know better. Fuck you. He screamed before laughing like a maniac and hanging up. I held the phone in my hands and stared at nothingness for a while. The teacher and principal came back in saying there was no blue Corolla outside. Shortly after, my dad arrived, and I was escorted to a taxi with him and the guards. I sat there and did nothing, as my dad talked on the phone to track the number that had been calling and find this person by the name of Paul. I took the rest of the week off school, and eventually I started to have nightmares about being outside and being grabbed. After this all happened, I did go back the next week, and instantly joined the kendo club in order to know something about self-defense especially if I got the chance to be armed with something. Years later, my mom and dad divorced. I saw that coming, though. After all, when this episode happened, I was living with my older brothers because they didn't want to involve me in all their fights. Once I came back home with my mom, though, I found out they had divorced because my father had five lovers in five different places. Some of them had even tried to harass my mother. That made me wonder. Could all of this kidnapping story have been a scheme from one of these lovers to steal my dad from us? If it was, that just makes me uncomfortable to know a human being is capable of killing someone's kid just to get what they want. Good thing is, I'm 20 today and I've never heard from that Paul again. I still wonder though what would have happened to me if I'd lapsed a bit and didn't have the knowledge to go back inside and kept looking for that person instead. From 2006 to 2008, I was a student at a university in England, studying paramedic science. This course was a two-year fast track into becoming a qualified paramedic and EMT. The course involved placements at various points throughout both years. First, we spent an evening slash night in a dispatcher's. I'll never forget some of those calls, like a man waking up in bed next to his wife only to find she died during the night. Next, we were stationed with the patient transport service, taking patients to their hospital appointments when they couldn't get there alone. And finally, after waiting a good six months for the opportunity, it was time to spend a prolonged placement with the 999 crews. You could choose a couple of preferred locations, and I was fortunate enough to be given the ambulance station close to my own home. Because of this, I moved back to my parents' home that winter for a full term, leaving my university buddies behind. In hindsight, I really wish I hadn't. The station was in Buxton, Derbyshire. Google map it. It's middle of nowhere territory. It's also 45 minutes from the nearest hospital, so you better not get hurt badly up there. Only, of course, people did. So one evening, we respond to a call where a guy has come off his bike on the cat and fiddle run. It's named after a pub by the same name on that road, which passes over the Pennines, a set of mountains. Bikers love to bomb it up and down. It's notorious. Guy broke a brick wall with his body. Legs were over his shoulders. We took him with blue lights to the aforementioned hospital, and I don't think he survived. This is where things got very messed up. We turn out of our hospital, travel maybe half a mile, and get flagged down by this pedestrian. She shouted through the window that somebody had been badly beaten. We later found out this was the case of somebody bumping into somebody else in a bar, nothing more. In that exact moment, a guy in a red shirt kind of stumbled out from a side street and collapsed into the road. I had been in the rear passenger seat of the patient compartment, with my mentor and her technician riding up front. They got out before me to help him, whilst I opened the side bay. Stupidly, I climbed out as my mentor helped him in. 
That's the point when I noticed two things. This man was not wearing a red t-shirt. He was topless and was saturated head to waist in his own blood. And now I realized there was a mob of people rushing straight towards us. Ten, maybe even as many as fifteen. I can't exactly remember. I was still outside the ambulance and was pretty much frozen in terror. I was only 19 at this point and still kind of a pussy. Thankfully, my mentor hauled me inside and locked the doors instantly. She turned back to me, asking if the rear door was locked. It was not. They opened it from the outside. My mentor pushed them back, and I couldn't believe it, started to heckle them, telling them to pick on a group of people and not just one man. She managed to kick them out and lock the door herself. What happened next will stick with me forever, clearly as I'm telling this story nearly ten years on. The people surrounded us and began to try and flip the ambulance over. Meanwhile, another guy started hammering the side window. He shattered it and even cut himself wide open with blood spraying everywhere, but he kept on going. They were like animals. There was a window between the rear and the front cabin. We could see a police car fast approaching. He didn't stop though and continued straight past. I don't really blame him for not wanting to take on 15 people all by himself though. Only later did I find out that the keys were still in the ignition as well. Nobody attempted to enter the cabin through sheer luck. After a while, the violent hooligan mob dispersed, but not before leaving a lasting mark on my psyche. You ever have one of those older brothers who likes to pull mean pranks on you and tries to scare you to death? You know the type I'm talking about shortly. The kind of brother who tries to convince you a monster is under your bed, or the boogeyman lives inside your closet. Do you know anyone who had an older brother like that? Well, I didn't have one. I had a younger brother who was like that. My little brother Tommy was not only three years younger than me, but also a very tiny thing. Physically, he was not threatening in the least, but mentally... He had an imagination that could scare the shit out of people three or four times his age. The worst thing he ever tried to do to me happened when we lived in a house in a new subdivision. After we'd all moved in, all four of us kids got our own room for the first time in our lives. Being the second oldest, I got the second choice of bedrooms. The room that I picked was not only the second biggest, but also had another feature I really enjoyed. It was very unique to the other rooms in the house. There was this trap door in the closet that led underneath the house. It was actually kind of weird, but I thought it was really neat. This trap door led to what you might call a crawl space, I suppose. It wasn't really shallow enough that you would have to crawl in it, though. A human being could very easily stand straight up and underneath the house with nary a problem. My brother Tommy just loved the idea of that trap door. He was actually quite mad at me for getting what he felt like was the most interesting feature in the entire house. Now, about a month after we'd moved in, he was still trying to get me to trade rooms with him so he could have the trap door in his closet. After that month of refusing, I suppose he finally snapped and got angry with me. Fine, if you don't want to trade rooms with me, then I'll leave you and Matilda alone, he told me. With that, Tommy turned and began to leave the room. Although I should have known better, I had to ask Tommy what the hell he was talking about. I'm talking about Matilda, Tommy replied. She's a homeless woman who lives in the crawl space. Actually, she was squatting in the house before we moved in. Once we showed up, she had to hide underneath. I figured I'd be nice and try to take this room off your hands since I'm not as big a chicken as you are, but I suppose if you want her, you can stay in the room where she has the most direct access to the house. With that, Tommy turned and swiftly left the room. I had to give it to my little brother. He had outdone himself this time. While this story did indeed give me the creeps, though, I knew it was just his attempt to get me to trade bedrooms with him, and I was not about to give in. Well, Tommy didn't give in either. He began to taunt me on a daily basis about this Matilda lady. He described her as an ugly, fat old hag lady dressed in ratty blue dresses. 
he told me he would often talk to her, and she told him she would sneak up into the house when the family wasn't home to grab food. She would then take it back into the crawl space. She would cook it over an open fire. Tommy told me that he told Matilda how much he wanted my room, and once even asked her if she would help him get it from me. According to Tommy, she'd readily agreed she would help scare me out of the room, but she had to pick the time, not him. I suppose it was a brilliant tactic on the part of my brother. It really left it open-ended as to when this imaginary woman would come attack me. This was his attempt to keep me on edge all the time. My brother was very smart after all, like I told you. When I still didn't budge though, my brother stepped up his torment. He started doing something to me every night before bedtime. He would taunt me, singing about how she lived in the crawl space through my door. Even though I really didn't believe him, it did unnerve me as I laid there in bed. I would always sneak a glance over at that closet and that trap door. As I went to sleep, I heard the voice of my little brother in my head. As he whispered over and over about how she lived in the crawl space. My brother's head games did begin to work, but I still didn't want to give in to him. In fact, it just had the opposite effect. I was even more determined to resist. It kind of made me mad he'd found such an effective way to get into my head. About a week after my brother had his little taunts, he came to my room again and was bugging me once more about Matilda. Right in the middle of his little game, though, we suddenly heard a noise. Tommy froze up and then slowly turned and looked over to the trap door. What the hell? He asked, fear appearing on his face for the first time maybe in his life. The moment he said it, I looked over and saw the trap door begin to lift up a bit. Tommy jumped, and I scrambled up onto my bed. Holy shit, what the fuck? Tommy screamed and jumped up with me. Oh my god, that must be Matilda, I shouted. He looked at me confused. Dude, what the hell are you talking about? You know I made that up just to get this room, right? I looked over to Tommy, then back over to the now lifting trap door. Well, then what the hell is that? Before either of us could answer, the trap door banged again. Tommy ran to the other side of the bedroom and cowered in fear. My little brother, the king of horror, cowered away in the corner. Tommy, I'm gonna go check it out, okay? I told my little brother as I hopped off the bed. I slowly and cautiously began to walk over to the trap door. Don't! I'm sorry I tried to scare you, but don't go over there! I didn't listen. You're my little brother and it's my job to protect you, I told him. If someone's down there, I have to find out what's going on. Tommy actually began to cry as I approached the trap door. With every bit of caution, I leaned over. With every bit of caution, I leaned over. I slowly reached my hand out in order to grab the brass ring on top of the door and pull that trap door open. As I did so, the door was thrust open in my hands. A hand reached out and grasped my wrist. I began to scream, and as I did, the hand pulled onto me. It was holding me tight, and it would not let me go. Tommy was still screaming and crying, and started screaming for our parents to come help. Well, the noise and the commotion caused my parents to sprint into the room. They saw what was going on. My mom ran over to Tommy and held him tight. My dad came over and fully pulled open the trap door. Revealing our older brother Joseph standing in the crawl space with a big dumb grin on his face. Holding my arm, my dad looked over to me and saw a grin on my face as well. Remember when I said I didn't have an older brother who would torment and scare me? Well, I didn't, but that night Tommy sure did. I recently moved to Colorado because I've always heard such stories about its beauty, and I've always been a really big fan of nature. Well, the fact that they legalized pot in the past few years really didn't hurt either, but that's kind of beside the point. I honestly had never seen the Rocky Mountains before, and I wanted to experience all the wonders of nature that John Denver was so ecstatic about that he had to write all those songs. Well, I wasn't disappointed. Colorado had a lot to appreciate, in addition to the mountains and forests and everything else. I also noticed that Colorado has a lot of tunnels as well. I mean, I suppose it does make sense. When you have so many mountains, you have to have a lot of tunnels too. 
I was particularly fascinated, however, with the train tunnels. Unlike car tunnels, train tunnels are not particularly well lit, and they're only really thin enough for the train to go through. There's a minor ledge on the side for a person to be up on just in case they're in there with the train, but other than that, there's really not much room. For some reason, I had become fascinated with these tunnels. I really wanted to try and walk through one of them, just to see what it would be like, you know? They were very old, looking like they had been constructed in the 19th century for all I knew. I just found them really fascinating. Now, before I go any further, I need to tell you what happens. This story has nothing to do with the actual train. I didn't accidentally go into the tunnel when a train was supposed to be coming, then run to the exit, only to just get out of there in the nick of time or something. Beforehand, I actually looked up the schedule online and was able to find a good period when there were no scheduled trains running for almost the entire day. And that was the perfect time for me to go and explore. And this tunnel I was going to was a particularly long one as well. Getting there was a little bit difficult even. Although there were no barriers, there was a lot of traffic on the interstate, and it went all throughout the mountains, of course. I was headed towards this tunnel in the middle of day, so I didn't have the cover of darkness to conceal me. I also wasn't brave enough to try and sneak into a tunnel at night. Instead, I put on an orange hazard vest. I wanted to at least try and make it look like I belonged there. I got to the tunnel without much incident, and held my breath as I went to venture in. It was really neat, and really light at first. As I mentioned though, this is a really long tunnel and there isn't really much lighting in the middle. Once I was far enough away from the entrance, it was pitch dark. I had brought along a flashlight, but I sort of wanted to see how long I could walk before it got so dark I couldn't see anymore. As I started walking down the tunnel and into the mountain, the light behind me got dimmer and dimmer. I knew I had almost a day's worth of time, so I wasn't in a particular hurry. Eventually, after a bit of winding, I was in the pitch black. It was pretty awesome, I have to tell you. I took out my flashlight and shone it along as I went on. It was so dark that that puny little beacon of light barely made an impact. As I continued walking in this silent darkness beside my footsteps, I heard a noise a bit off into the tunnel. It sounded like someone else was walking as well, but I doubted that could possibly be the case. I mean, what are the chances that someone else was walking this far into the train tunnel at the same time I was? Only a few moments later, though, I began to hear it again. It definitely sounded like some sort of footsteps, and it was coming from the direction I was walking toward. I wondered if this might be an animal or something. I began to get concerned. I didn't know all the wildlife that was in Colorado, and I was walking through a narrow tunnel deep into a mountain. It was not going to be easy to get away unless I was able to find a ring to turn me invisible. I considered turning around and going back because I kept hearing that sound over and over. As I stood there and tried to listen a bit closer, I began to hear what was definitely the clacking sound of shoes. It was coming from even deeper inside. I was in a bit of a quandary here. The ledge I was walking on was not particularly wide, so if I turned around and began to walk away out of the tunnel, I would be turning my back completely on what could potentially be a dangerous person. It would be very difficult to defend myself if I were to be attacked. If I kept walking forward though, I could simply be presenting myself to them. I really didn't know what to do now. I stood there waiting, feeling like time was going on and on. I heard the footsteps coming slowly closer and closer. I still wasn't sure what to do. Finally, I took my flashlight and tried to shine it deeper down into the tunnel. It took several moments to notice, but I finally saw a figure approaching through the darkness. There was a hunched over person whose face looked very morose with his eyes completely closed. He was a pale gray color, but I figured that might just be because of the darkness. I stood there frozen as he continued to get closer and closer. Eventually, he stopped in place, and then the most terrifying thing happened. He moved his head, and I realized that was not his head at all. He was holding what looked like a decapitated head in front of him. At least, there was a large bag that had a similar shape that he was holding. 
He smiled at me with his eyes still closed and called out, Hey, you want to join my head collection? I turned around and booked it out of that tunnel like he would not believe. I have no idea if the man tried to follow me, but even if he did, he was much smaller and older than I was. I really doubted he would be able to keep up. In that moment, I didn't particularly care either. I just ran and ran and didn't stop until I not only reached the end of the tunnel, but sprinted through the opening, got to my car, and drove off onto the interstate. I really don't know what the hell that was, or how that man seemed to get a human head, but I know I'll never go wandering into train tunnels ever again. This isn't a particularly long story, but it is easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. When I was a younger child, I was deathly afraid of the typical things. Monsters in my closet or something hiding underneath my bed. I would always have to check both of them before going to sleep, so much so that it became a daily routine. I would go over, open the closet door, have a good look around, and then close and latch it. Afterwards, I would go over, kneel down in front of my bed, and peer underneath. After I confirmed that there was nothing there, I would turn off the light and hurry over to my bed, which was placed up against the wall. I would keep myself against the wall until I fell asleep. Of course, I always felt silly in the morning, and promised myself I would not do it again the next night. Regardless, when the next night rolled around, there again I would be. I was about 11 years old when, for the first time, I had a friend over to spend the night. My parents had this weird rule that we couldn't have friends stay overnight until we reached the age of 11. I don't really know why that specific age, but anyway, my friend Kevin and I watched some scary movies after my parents went to bed. When we were done, he went to my room. He put a big sleeping bag on the floor right next to my bed. It was a sleepover, so we weren't really planning on going to sleep just then. He laid down and started chatting, as I was laying on my bed and he in his bag. Suddenly, he got up, went over, and turned out the light. I actually felt a bit of a jolt go through me, because I hadn't expected him to do that. As Kevin got back into his bag and we continued to chat, I found that doing so had become somewhat strained. For the first time since I could remember, I was in my room in the dark without having checked either the closet or under the bed for intruders. Of course, the fact that we had watched scary movies really didn't help either. While we laid there in the dark talking, Kevin seemed to realize I was really tense. He made some bad gay joke that I was scared he was going to make a move on me, and we both laughed a bit together. I tried to relax for a while and keep chatting but it wasn't long before Kevin had drifted off and stopped responding. Laying there awake and somewhat alone now was a bit frightening to me. I tried to just close my eyes and go to sleep, but it was too difficult. I knew I had to do my routine or I would not be getting any sleep that night. Of course, I couldn't turn the light on without Kevin waking up. I had a little book light on my nightstand, though, so I grabbed it and moved out. I listened to Kevin's snores as I hopped off the bed very lightly. I crept over to the closet, making as little noise as I could. I turned the doorknob very slowly until I heard it click open. Opening it a bit, I shone the book light into it and confirmed it was indeed empty. I closed the door and made my way back over to the bed. I crawled up onto it because I figured I could just lean over and peer underneath. I took the light and slowly looked over the side only to find myself looking into the eyes of a little boy hiding under my bed. I jumped in fright and dropped the book light on the floor. Kevin, of course, came out from underneath, laughing his ass off at me. Heaving from under the bed, he told me he was sorry, but he just couldn't resist when he'd woken up and saw me checking out the closet. He just had to try and scare me. I appreciated that, I mean, that's what male friends do to each other. Still, I asked him to turn the light on for me, so I could calm down a little bit. He got up, went over to the light, and flipped it on. When Kevin looked back at me, though, he turned as white as a sheet. I followed his gaze, toward the foot of my bed, to see what had scared him. 
There was a little girl our age, standing at the foot of the bed in a nightgown. I couldn't see her face for some reason. She was quiet for a moment, then said, I'd like to play. The lights went out, and then, when they came back on, she was just gone. Kevin stood there for a moment before asking if he could sleep in the same bed tonight. Yes was my only reasonable response. I'd woken up in the middle of the night, but I wasn't quite sure why yet. Not only did I work 12-hour shifts during the day, which obviously weared me out, but I was one of those really deep sleepers, even when my alarm clock would wake me up. It took me a little while to realize that it was indeed my alarm clock going off. Even then, I had a really hard time shaking the grogginess. After a few moments, I realized my daughter was standing on the side of my bed, trying to wake me up apparently. I fumbled around for my glasses, but I couldn't find where they were, couldn't remember where I'd left them either. She was tugging on my sleeve, so I gave up finding them immediately. My wife was out of town, so I had the whole bed to myself. Somehow, I rolled all the way over onto the other side. I was so exhausted, I didn't want to do anything. I just gave up and asked my daughter what was wrong. There's a ghost in my room, she told me, fear evident in her voice. If my wife had been home, she would have let her climb into bed with us. I, however, really didn't like that kids have to get over being scared of the dark. That was not going to happen if parents continued to baby them and indulge their fantasies about ghosts and monsters. Sweetie, there's no such thing as ghosts, I told her. You need to go back to bed. Daddy has to work in the morning and you can't go to school all tired either. But there's a ghost in my room, I swear there is! I groaned. I didn't believe this sort of nonsense and I wasn't happy my daughter was obviously believing it either. I rolled over and managed to pull myself up to a seated position. Sweetheart, it's not true. Whatever's in your room is just your imagination. Now, go back to bed. My daughter stopped for a moment and seemed to think about what I just said to her. Okay, Dad, could you at least check my room for me to make sure? I supposed it would be the best way for me to get back to sleep. If I check your room out, will you go back to bed? I promise, she told me. I humped up out of bed and went out of my room and into the hallway. I felt like I was almost drunk as I stumbled around. I was so exhausted I could barely even walk straight. The only thing I knew was that when I got back to bed, I might never wake up again with how tired I was. When we got to the room, my daughter jumped into bed and got onto the blankets. Check in the closet, please. Slowly, I made my way over. Grabbing the door, I rolled it open and looked inside. Of course, there was nothing there. I let her know this. She seemed very pleased. Okay, check under the bed too. Will you go to bed right after I do? I asked her. She promised, so I staggered over, grabbed the side of the bed to steady myself, and when I had the leverage I needed, I lowered myself down and peeked under the bed. Much like I had expected, there was nothing there. I was about to straighten myself back up, when the grogginess started to clear up a little bit, and suddenly, I realized something. My daughter had gone with my wife to visit her parents, and I was supposed to be in the house alone. I felt like my heart stopped as I thought back to that character now on the bed. I quickly jumped up to my feet, only to see that no one was there anymore. Nervous now and just a little bit scared, I jumped away. I half expected someone to reach out and grab my leg or something. Shakily, I made my way back to my bedroom. I turned all the lights on, because I'll admit, I was pretty scared. I repeated the same routine I'd done in my daughter's room. Checked under my bed, in the closet... I checked everywhere else as well. Nothing to be found. I slept with the light on that night. When my wife got home, I told her what had happened, and she got a pretty good chuckle out of making fun of me. Now, whenever my daughter comes to my room claiming she's seen a ghost or a monster, I just let her crawl into bed with me.